Well, a very good afternoon to you. Hello, and welcome inside Municipal Stadium, right here in the middle of Waterbury, Connecticut, for a gigantic CACC conference doubleheader featuring your post-university Eagles and the visiting Rams of Jefferson University. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Del Sordo. Thank you for tuning in to the Nest, the Nest Network. You can watch all post-university sports live and online on YouTube as well at Go Post Eagles on YouTube.com. So today, two gigantic games here in the CACC featuring two teams at the top of their respected divisions. For Post University, it was a tough start to the season, only 5-13 and in non-conference play, but oh my goodness, have they found their swagger come CACC time. The best record in the CACC, 13-5 and in 18 games played, and they're playing host to Jefferson U, who is one game behind them in the win column. They're sitting at 12-5 and in the CACC, and 24-12 and on the season. The divisions split in the CACC between the North and the South, and Jeff Yu is in front of Goldie Beacom, Wilmington, Holy Family, and Chestnut Hill as we enter play this afternoon. But things are pretty tight down there in the Southern Division. They have Goldie Beacom just one game behind them, Wilmington three games behind them. So two wins for Jefferson University, and they're feeling good in that South Division. For post, same story. They're a game and a half ahead of Felician, three games ahead of Dominican. They already have three games that they have on the schedule against Bloomfield that they're not going to play. We're not counting those as wins yet as I broadcast this game, but just know that there's three more kind of guaranteed wins on the schedule for post-university. So hypothetically, if you get two wins today in this doubleheader for the Eagles, well, you're going to be looking at at least 18 conference wins this season. Let's take a run through both teams' starting lineups. We'll start with the Rams from Jefferson University. The starting third baseman, the leadoff hitter, is Justin Egner. He's a true freshman out of Hatfield, Pennsylvania. Batting second for the Rams, Chris McLean. He's the team's first baseman this afternoon. Also from Hatfield, PA, both Egner and McLean teammates at North Penn High. Now this is fun. Stick with me here, folks. Batting third for the Rams is Josh Lopez, the team's catcher from Danbury, Connecticut. Batting fifth for the Rams, Joshua Lopez, the team's left fielder, a sophomore out of Nanuit, New York. Now we'll go back to the cleanup spot. That's where Marquise Wood bats for the Rams. He's a senior out of Philadelphia, PA. Gabe Silva, the six-hole hitter, playing shortstop this afternoon for Jefferson University. Justin Espinal, the designated hitter, he'll bat seventh. He's got some pop down there in the bottom of the order. Three home runs, 26 ribbies already on the season. Alex Gonzalez gets the start at second base for the Rams. He's in his senior season out of Eatontown, New Jersey. And Jordan, let me make sure I have this right, Ty Bercio is your ninth hitter in the lineup for the Rams, and he will start today playing center field in his freshman season out of Warminster, Pennsylvania. On the bump for the Jefferson University Rams this afternoon, number 26, Tyler Bem. Tyler is a sophomore out of New Hope, Pennsylvania, from that Central Bucks system up there that no matter which one of the three Central Bucks high schools you go to, they produce athletes. He went to CB East. He hits the mound this afternoon. Not the best ERA on the team, but his win-loss record, it's fine. This is going to be his fourth start, his seventh appearance for Bem. A 3-2 and two win-loss record coming into action today. 7.41 on the ERA. And remember, folks, we do have a doubleheader in front of us. So more than likely in this seven-inning game, expect Bem to pitch two or three and not much more than that. So that's the starting lineup for Jefferson University in game one. Let's go to your Eagles. Michael Pavelcheck, one of the many players on the roster celebrating his senior day this afternoon, out in right, leading off Evan Cornwell. He's a, a, a gold glove specialist defend, defending shortstop. He's also batting 323 this season. He hits second. Chris Corchado, right where you expect him to be, batting third. The big first baseman leading the Eagles with a 388 average this season. And he's third on the team with 25 RBI. Jimmy Brennan gets the start behind the plate. He's catching, batting cleanup. A lot of pop in that bat. And Jimmy contributing with the average as well this season. He's up to 310 
on the year. DJ Karen, another one of those seniors. He's a grad trans. RBIs, total bases. It's a luxury to have him in the fifth hole in the order, and he gets the start today in left field. Justin Rivera, another solid hitter and a great glove on the hot corner. He's batting six, playing third. Jalen Kelly, probably the hottest hitter on Post University right now. I called a doubleheader two weeks ago against Goldie Beacom College. At the start of that game, Jalen Kelly was batting 248. You look at the season spread right now, he's up to 317, two homers, 13 RBI. He's batting seventh. He will be your designated hitter. Hunter Keller, defensive specialist right there at second base. He will bat eighth. And then Danny Gill, another one of those seniors, the California resident from West LA Community College, rounds out your starting nine. He's batting ninth, playing center field. Matt Seaman. On the mound for the Eagles in the middle of a fantastic senior campaign. Pitched a no-hitter earlier this year. Comes into action today with a 4-2 and win-loss record. This is his 10th appearance. All 10 appearances have come in starts. So Matt Seaman, Tyler Bem, that's your pitching matchup here. We have Ray Scold across home plate from Pat Horvath. Horvath in his 14th year at the helm of the Jefferson University Rams and He's been coaching basically since the second he graduated college. Was a graduate of Palm Beach Atlantic 19 years ago. Did some minor league coaching. Made his way up to Philadelphia. And he's been running the Rams ever since. Ray Scold in his fifth year at the helm of the Eagles. He's a post-university graduate. Graduated from post in 2010. They're having this discussion here. So we'll take a quick break. When we come back, it's going to be time for the first pitch. A gigantic conference doubleheader here at Municipal Stadium. Don't go anywhere. You're watching Post University Baseball on CACC, CACC Network and the Nest Network. And remember, you can head over to YouTube and watch every game live at Go Post Eagles on YouTube.
Welcome back inside Municipal Stadium. Game one of two seven-inning doubleheaders here today on Senior Day. My name is Chris Del Sordo, and you are tuned in to the Nest Network, post-university athletics on the CACC Network. And if you're not online at CACC Sports, you can also view post-university athletics live on YouTube at Go Post Eagles. So it's Matt Seaman on the mound to start off this contest for the Eagles. Tyler Bem across from him for the Rams. And for Bem, unless he gets off to a otherworldly start this afternoon, probably Jefferson University going to utilize their bullpen for game one. For the Eagles, the game plan is simple. Let number 22 find his rhythm and let him work. He's got a 4-2 and two record on the season. He started all nine games he's played in, and he's up to 53 innings pitched on the season. So that's almost six innings per contest. I already told you. We're going seven, so if your head coach, Ray Scold, you're, you can never bank on it, but you're almost banking on, you're very much hoping for Seaman's ability to go the distance here in game one. Now, none of that's, that's not a given. None of that's granted, and it becomes an extra difficult situation when you go up and down this Jefferson University batting order. Only one player, the designated hitter, funny enough, Justin Espinall, is under 300. But he hits 298 and has three home runs and 26 RBIs. And so all nine players on this Rams roster today can put bat to ball. It's going to behoove Seaman to get ahead in these counts, pepper the strike zone. And listen, it's a big outfield out here at Municipal Stadium. If those balls get into the gaps, a lot of times you have standard doubles in most ballparks that become easy triples out here in this big outfield. And so expecting a potential for some offense here. Seaman, he can put an end to that. The leadoff hitter getting us started, Justin Egner. He gets the start on third base this afternoon, and that one dots the outside corner, starting Matt Seaman's afternoon with a called strike. Egner leading all players on the Rams with a 362 average. Oh, one pitch. Big swing from Egner. He's a little out in front as Seaman took something off, and there you go. It's early in the contest, but two pitches... Two strikes and a broadcaster's dream at how quickly Matt Seaman is working here. Brennan setting up on the outside corner for the 0-2 pitch. It's pulled a little bit. Now I mentioned Egner and the two-hole hitter Chris McLean, both from Hatfield, Pennsylvania. Both attended North Penn High. 1-2 pitch coming up. Little break on that from Seaman. It looks like it got back over home plate, but it misses high. Some animation there from Seaman. Doesn't get the call, and the count goes back even at 2-2. Two and two. And that school, North Penn High, is really the public high school athletic gem in the Philadelphia area. At Jefferson University, right there in the city of Philly. It's patience here at the box as Egner has worked this count back full to 3-2. and two. Matt Seaman delivers. That one just misses the outside corner. Some great patience right there from Justin Egner. He fell behind in the count and ultimately works a walk on six pitches. So it brings up his high school teammate, Chris McLean, and have similar looks here. Long hair, right-handed batter. McLean bats with a crouched open stance, and so, yeah, your mirrored image of your number one hitter back at the plate. McLean shows bunt, and that one does catch the outside corner. The third baseman, Rivera, all over that, and the first baseman, Corchado, was holding the runner on. It didn't look like McLean, if he laid that bunt down, was trying to push it down the right field line. And he'll show bunt again. Seaman tries to pepper that outside corner again. That one misses low, and it'll even us back out at 1-1. One and one. Funny enough that you have a freshman and sophomore hitting 1-2 from the same high school in the lineup. But they're 1-2 and two in terms of average and a lot of other offensive statistics. In fact, McLean right now, the team's leader with 44 base hits on the season. And he's tied for third in runs scored with 38. So a bit of a youth movement right now for Jefferson University, and they're not complaining by any means. Twice as many wins as losses now on the season at 24-12. and 12. And they're sitting atop the South Division of the CACC with, in a, with a 12, pardon me, 12-5 and five record. That one just couldn't catch the inside corner, and so the same scenario, two ABs in a row for Matt Seaman, finding himself ahead 
Now having to buckle down. 2-2 pitch coming. That one misses wide. Runner goes. Brennan's throw is on time, and the tag is applied. Caught stealing on the play is Justin Egner, and that's a great way to brush off a leadoff walk. Egner. Gun down, he was 9 of 11 on stolen base attempts coming into action today. Make it 9 of 12 as Brennan showing off the cannon. It was a decent jump. It was a perfect pop throw, and the location was great too. 3-2 pitch. Wow, for the second batter in a row, Seaman gets ahead. He was ahead of Egner 0-2 before walking Egner on six pitches. Was ahead of McLean 1-2 before walking him on six pitches. So the same story, two batters in a row. One out, runner on first, and it's Josh Lopez up next for the Rams. <clears throat> Joshua Lopez and Josh Lopez, aside from the number and the name, there's so many similarities about them. Josh at bat right now hitting 340. Josh with a five-hole hitter hitting 345. And this Josh Lopez with three home runs, 16 RBI on the season. Very patient battery. Second on the team with 19 walks. He leads the team in total bases on the year with 86. Sixteen home runs, my apologies. I was at the wrong slot there. So he's a power hitter, but this could be a double play ball. At short, turn, six, four, three, and the Eagles are out of trouble. Two different base runners get on. But two end up stranded as it's a huge 6-4-3 double play. Cornwell jumps on it, turns it to Keller, and Corchado seals the deal. We are through the top of the first inning. We head to the bottom of the first, nodded at nothing. You are watching Post-University Athletics on the CACC Network. Welcome back to Municipal Stadium in Waterbury, Connecticut. We are headed into the bottom of the first inning. I, I want to call it a stellar start for Matt Seaman, and the results were just that. He walked the first two batters, but he got Justin Egner caught stealing on a great throwout by Jimmy Brennan from behind the plate. And then he walked the next hitter, Chris McLean, only to get one of the hottest hitters on the planet, Josh Lopez. Yes, 16 dingers, 40 ribbies, Josh Lopez, to ground into a double play deep in the hole, but Evan Cornwall gets back there. Backhands it, and then Cornwell able to get the one-motion spin to Hunter Keller. Another tough play for Keller to get it over to Corchado in time, but a thing of beauty on that double play has Seaman out of the first with no hits allowed and no real trouble. I'm getting the live stats up here for you and believe it was 14, no, 15 pitches to get Seaman out of the first inning. He wasn't necessarily around the strike zone. He threw seven strikes to eight balls, but he's out of there. And remember, we're only playing seven in each of these games. Michael Pavelchak leading us off here for the Eagles. And he'll take that first pitch well inside to put him ahead in the count. 1-0. and oh. Michael, one of 11 seniors celebrating their senior day here at Municipal Stadium. 
Second on the team this year with a 364 average, and he spits on that one that misses low and away. Pavelchak, the Nyack New York native. Searching for history right now. That pitch misses high, putting Pavelchak ahead in the count 3-0. and oh. He just recently joined the 150 career hit club and now is 12 hits away from the post-university all-time career hit record. So we'll keep our eyes on that as we progress. You know, six games left this season. That one, a get-over pitch for Tyler Bem, does catch the outside corner. And Pavelchak has to go one pitch longer here. It's 3-1. and one. Bem working quickly. That one was down the middle and just a hair late. You can see Pavelchak grab the batting helmet. I think he wants that one back as he fouls it off and out of play down the left field line. Michael, 51 hits on the season. Only eight extra base hits, though. So a really good table setter, and he'll do that right there, set the table as it's a walk on seven pitches. So the same story on both sides. An early walk here puts a potentially speedy base runner on to set the table. Now, if Pavelcheck tries to fall in line with the approach of Justin Egner, he's working with similar odds. He's attempted nine stolen bases on the season. He's seven of nine on the campaign. Evan Cornwell, we just saw him flash the leather at shortstop. He's your two-hole hitter this afternoon. Evan, a switch hitter out of Pompton Lakes, New Jersey. Up there in North Jersey, outside of New York. And actually a D1 transfer. He started his collegiate career at the University of Delaware. That's CAA baseball in Division I. Bem. Well, he's thinking about Pavelchak on first. He knows his capability of stealing bases and had to see the Seaman-Brennan connection get an easy out that way. So he's not going to be forgetting about Michael Pavelchak on first. We'll try again for the first pitch to Cornwell. Cornwell shows bunt, drops down a beauty. This is going to be a tough play for the third baseman, Egner, and he gets the out at first. Decent read there. It didn't look like necessarily the best jump for Egner. But he comes up firing a fairly speedy runner in Evan Cornwell. Gets him out by a couple of steps at first. It does move Pavelcheck into scoring position, and that's just what you want to see with Chris Corchado at the plate. The junior first baseman out of Manalapan, New Jersey, leads the team with a phenomenal 388 batting average on the season. And Bem misses away there. Eight pitches so far for Tyler Bem in this contest. Five balls, three strikes. Shortstop there, Silva, maybe sneaking in behind Pavelcheck, potentially to hold him on. Here's the 1-0 pitch to Corchado. Laces that one into the gap. Let's see, Pavelcheck didn't get the best jump on that one. It's fielded cleanly by Lopez, who gets it in very quickly. So Pavelcheck holds it third, but yet another base hit for Chris Corchado. He just keeps that line moving. Leads the Eagles now with 53 hits, and he's on it first. You like to see this, but the double play is still in order now. Jimmy Brennan at the dish with one out. And already, it's still there for Jefferson University. We're, we're very early in this contest as that's not head coach Horvat. That looks like Abraham Almonte, one of the pitching coaches now, discussing things over with Tyler Bem. You're in a good spot where if you can do what Post University did and turn the double play here, you're out of trouble. If you walk Brennan or let him get a base hit, well, you're still at one out, and then you either have a run across or the base is loaded. Bem, we don't expect him to, to attempt to go the distance this afternoon anyway. I can't think that Jefferson would already warm up anyone in their bullpen, and that's not what we have going on right now, but a bit of a lengthy discussion at the mound, and our home plate umpire is now there. I think he's trying to break this conversation up, but Almonte's still there, and he's got the entire Jefferson University infield around him. You can see Jimmy Brennan here. I mean, he's been in the on-deck circle for... Eight minutes. He's been waiting. He's been waiting to walk up to home plate for the past two, and there we go. The umpire, I think, finally is able to convince Jefferson to end their mound visit. 
So hopefully Tyler Bem heard what he wanted to hear. If not, he certainly has a lot to think about now after that extended conference. And here we go. Jimmy Brennan with runners on first and third. Corchado on at first. Pavelcheck on at third. Nothing, nothing game here in the bottom of the first inning with one out. Bem comes set. Fires from the stretch. That one's chopped down the third baseline. And it's like about five feet foul. Coach Scold is your third base coach for post-university here. And this is only my third game calling the Eagles this season. He's shown to be a bit of a, a conservative sender. You saw it right there on the base hit from Corchado in the left as that one dots the outside corner. And Brennan not happy as he's behind in the count 0-2. But that ball's laced off the bat of Corchado. It gets into left field quickly. Pavel checks fast, but Scold takes no chances early in the game. Brennan down 0-2. That one... He thought about offering at it, but it misses high. He keeps the bat on his shoulder, and he gets one back here. The Eagles strike out less than their opponents, but they strike out more than the NCAA average. Oh, wow, and they do right there, and Jimmy Brennan already not thrilled with the home plate umpire. And folks, remember, he is your catcher, so you don't want your catcher being too animated with the man calling the balls and strikes in the first inning. But... We'll keep our eyes on that. That's the game's first strikeout as Brennan goes down looking. A big breaking ball there for Bem. Sits him down. And just like Seaman, he has an opportunity to get himself out of trouble here. But the one of the most dangerous and the most powerful hitter right now in the post-university lineup at the dish in the form of DJ Karen, the Branford, Connecticut native, also celebrating his senior day. Well, that pitch was called a ball. Pretty close to the outside corner, so that outside corner, already some variability we've seen. Karen, he'll take it, even to the count at one and one. The runner, Corchado, feigned going on that play. I don't believe Chris has attempted a stolen base. He is not, so nobody was buying that fake, and that pitch comes across. Karen behind in the count, one and two. That one misses wide, and so count back even at two and two. The scoreboard has it at three and one. I believe the first pitch was a strike. There we go. Yeah, two and two. Two and two is the count. So a good eye right there from Karen on a potential put-away pitch, but Bem gets another one here on the two-two count. He delivers. That one's slapped at. Nice fight there from DJ Karen to keep it alive. DJ third on the team with a 336 average. Post knocking on wood, they haven't really been bit by the injury bug, and they have four players that have played and started all 39 games of the season. Karen is one of them. He's out in left field this afternoon. We've seen him play in left field and center. You have Danny Gill out in center. That is one of the best field covering range glove guys you can get defensively. Karen has some speed to cover ground in the outfield as well. Looking to deliver with the bat here, and he pops this one up a mile high. Lopez, he never saw it, but he was never really too worried about it as it's way out of play. And we'll do this again two and two. Karen leading the Eagles with four home runs, also leads the team in doubles with 11 and triples with four. So this is a man not content with base hits. He loves going the extra base route. The Eagles would love one right here, 2-2 two -two pitch. That one misses low and away. Pot potentially Jimmy Brennan, the one that we're hearing from the Eagles dugout right now, is that low and outside corner. Bem has been attacking it. This ump, is, he's given it a couple of times. It wasn't to be had there, and Karen can walk himself a bases loaded opportunity here. 3-2 pitch coming. Instead, he swings. He gets jammed. This is down the line. It's a fair ball. Pavelcheck walking home. Corchado got a great jump. That throw comes in quickly. Karen slides in safely with a double. What did I say? The man who loves extra base hits delivers for the Eagles. And it's a 1-0 lead here in the bottom of the first. And even better, runners on second and third still just one out. So Justin Rivera, the third baseman, your sixth hitter up. Here in the bottom of the first inning as the post-university Eagles leading one to nothing here. One run on two hits so far. That pitch misses low and away, and now the post-university dugout making plenty of noise here. Tyler Bem, this pitch count rising. That was his 20th pitch of the first inning. Half of them have gone for strikes. 
That one misses inside. In Rivera, you have a very, very disciplined hitter. 276 on the season. But he's walked 11 times. Only 14 strikeouts. And that's the lowest of, or the second lowest of any regular starting lineup member for the Eagles. A chance to deliver here with a 2 0 count coming in. They keep the red light on, and he takes one right down the middle. Bem gets one back. Tyler Bem, the starter for the Rams. He's in his sophomore season. 17 innings of work this year. This one's laced. Wood has an angle on it, and it will drop in front of Wood. And what a read by DJ Carrot. He was running all the way. He'll come across and score as well. Corchado scores. Karen scores, and it's a big two RBI base hit for Justin Rivera. Coming into action today, you look at the numbers that both of these teams boast and figured we would see some runs scored this afternoon. Well, it's starting early for the post-university Eagles. Carrot, an RBI double. Rivera, a two RBI single. Corchado and Karen score, and what a start for post-university. And now they bring arguably the hottest hitter in the CACC to the dish in Jalen Kelly. Kelly behind in the count, 0-1, big swing there, and he lifts this one high to straightaway center. Wood takes two steps in, now coming in, and he squeezes it for the third out. Well, the Eagles with a statement. They get out of trouble in the top of the first, and they make some trouble for Jefferson U in the bottom of the first. We'll head to the top of the second inning. Your Eagles up 3-0. So we're here in the top of the second inning. It is our second low, or pardon me, we're up to the cleanup hitter here, Marquise Wood. That one off the outside corner, but the strike, it's given by this umpire. So it's, it's tough to catch a strike inside on this man we've seen up to this point, but he's, he's giving those outside corners. That one, that one does miss outside to even the count back out at one and one would yet another dangerous hitter in the middle of this Rams lineup 341 on the season oh just a ho-hum seven homers 44 RBIs in fact Wood is the team's leader in RBIs he has four more than Josh Lopez Josh Lopez number 24 because we also have Josh Lopez, number one, about to bat here for the Rams. Oh, another one on the outside corner, and now Marquise Wood. Th that was a great moment right there. Wood looks at the umpire, motions to Brennan. Brennan was obviously laughing about it, so at least Jimmy Brennan has made himself okay with this home plate umpire. Wood takes the same pitch, but that one misses low, and so the count goes even. Matt Seaman got out of the first inning. With 15 pitches thrown. Unfortunately here, it looks like he's going to have a similar struggle. I mean, he only faced three batters. He walked two of those batters, but was able to get one caught stealing and turn a double play. But with that walk now, he's up to 22 pitches over four batters faced. And you have the second of two Josh Lopez's up. Almost as dangerous as the first. In fact, a slightly higher average for this Joshua Lopez, the sophomore out of Nanuit, New York. 
He's hitting 345 with four homers and 37 RBIs. That one's behind him. On it is Brendan. Are you kidding me? They, oh, he can't do anything wrong. Guns down a runner in the top of the first. This one looked to skirt away from him. He was all over it. Wood tried to test the arm, and Marquise Wood just got caught stealing for the first time in 29 attempts. That is unbelievable the afternoon that Jimmy Brennan has gotten off to a start. And now, once again, Seaman doesn't have to worry about any base runners. He misses that one outside, but how good must that feel knowing that you have that defensive support behind you like that in the form of Jimmy Brennan? 2-0 pitch coming from Seaman. Late swing right there from Joshua Lopez. It looked as if Lopez was, was wanting to take all the way, and he saw that that one was down the middle, and so he threw a late swing on it. Gets one back for Seaman, 2-1. Matt making his team high 10th start of the season for post. Brilliant breaking ball there. Pulls the string on that one. And even you can see Joshua Lopez takes a couple of steps out of the batter's box and gives a nice little head nod of respect on that one. It had him bailing and it catches the inside corner. A chance for a put away here for Matt Seaman on the 2-2 pitch. Breaking ball. That one's laced into the gap and it will drop in in front of DJ Karen. He's to it quickly, but there is your first base hit for the Jefferson University Rams, and it comes off the bat of Joshua Lopez. This is funny, folks. We've five batters so far for Jefferson University. Three of them have walked. One of them has gotten a base hit, and yet here we are right now in the top of the second inning. Just, just one hit, technically, so far for Jeff Yu. Gabe Silva, the shortstop. Takes that one on the outside corner. And Seaman ahead of a batter here in the second inning. He's out in front 0-1. Silva, a sophomore. Breaking ball there. Silva's listed at 5'4", and so that bodes well for his strike zone. But Seaman was able to drop that one in, and quickly, Gabe Silva finds himself behind in the count. 0-2. Contact hitter hitting 340 on the season, but he strikes out his fair share. He is K'd 18 times on the year. That ranks fourth of all Jefferson University batters. Seaman would love a chance for a strikeout early here. That one bounces low on the breaking ball. Brennan all over it, though. No chance for the runner to go in it. At this point... If you're Jefferson University, I, you have to assume they might be a little gun-shy. It was a decent jump the, uh, from the first runner, Egner. He was out by a full step. And then Wood was 29 for 29 on the season, and that ball looked like it was away from Brennan, and instead he gets the easy stolen base. Now this one does squirt through Brennan, and it was read well by Joshua Lopez. He's well around second base, so he'll claim that. And we'll get our second look with a runner in scoring position for the Rams. Count is even for Gabe Silva at 2-2. Two and two. Jimmy Brennan asking for time here, and he'll, he'll talk it over with Matt Seaman. After Gabe Silva in the lineup for Jefferson U, it's their designated hitter, Justin Espinal. Interesting statistic for Espinal. He probably doesn't enjoy it all that much, but he's the only player in the starting lineup for Jefferson not hitting 300 on the season. He is at 298, however, and you have to worry about his pop. Three home runs, 26 RBIs. 11 extra base hits on the season. He's also a patient batter. Only 84 ABs on the season. He's walked 11 times. That's who you have up in the on-deck circle. So if you're Seaman, you really want to retire Silva here and make it easier on yourself with two outs. That one misses low. Solid job by Brennan to keep it in front again. Well, it hasn't come back to bite him yet, but Matt Seaman having some trouble finding the strike zone this afternoon. He's thrown 29 pitches. 16 of those 29 pitches have been balls. But a chance to erase that with one pitch to Silva. Breaking ball, and it's just fouled off by Silva. In fact, it looked like it gets the glove of the catcher, Brennan, and it got a lot of the mask of our home plate umpire here. Good gamesmanship here. Sportsmanship is the post dugout, bringing a couple of extra baseballs to the... I'm just give, giving him that extra second or two to compose himself. He wore that one square off the mask, and he'll give it an adjustment. 
long AB here developing for Gabe Silva. Silva also a phenomenal pitcher in this staff for Jeff Yu. Late runoff there by Cornwell. Oh, they actually had Lopez leaning off the bag. That might be a balk. Yes, it was. So too much hesitate, too much time between the look back to second. It was basically as if he reestablished himself into his stretch. You can't do that. As long as you never do make the full... Well, I'm not going to go down that road because actually there are so many caveats into the process of then what makes a balkable pitch happen or not. But that is a balk issued against Matt Seaman. We don't get that often. And let's see, we have a timeout on the field. The second base umpire, I don't know if he necessarily agrees with the call here from the home plate up. And you can see Coach Almonte on at third base for the Rams just trying to get closer to that conversation as there's a possibility that they might reverse this balk and send Lopez back to second. But Silva, he's still in the batter's box right now. He is the team's leader in ERAs. He's pitched seven times. He's made six starts. Has a 4-1 and one record as a starting pitcher. Now you find, as you go across different levels of college baseball, a lot of you know two-way type players, players that can pitch and hit, but... It is rare to see a 4 and 1 starter with a 178 ERA also come on and play short, bat 6 and hit 340 in the process. So they have something here on the campus of Jefferson U and added extra to that, he's only in his sophomore season. So he's already finding this success as a sophomore. Whatever they determined, they just ex they just explained to head coach Scold and what they determined was that it was not a balk on Matt Seaman. So, Coach Skold, he has nothing to complain about right now. You can see here Horvath and another member of the coaching staff with Silva all talking to our home to our second base umpire. Silva probably, he has a little bit of an extra dog in the fight. He's a starting pitcher. He knows exactly what you can and can't do to make a pitch a balk. And so, he's pleading the case as well to try and get Joshua Lopez back over to third. And now I can't even I can't even offer what may have happened on that. It's not it's not a balk. It's not a balk. There we go. Step one. Step two was because it was not a balk, that pitch then counts. And that pitch was a ball. And so Silva walks on the play. Thanks for Jack, thank you for sticking through with me on that one. We all thought it through out loud, and I think we got to the end result right there. Unfortunately for the Eagles. You don't have that runner at third, but now you have runners on first and second, and that big bat of Justin Espinall in the right-handed batter's box. So for Matt Seaman, that is the third walk he has issued this afternoon. And once again, he's got a chance to get out of an inning with potentially a double play. But another ball here on this first pitch misses outside. And of the 28 pitches Matt Seaman has thrown this afternoon, now 16 of them have been balls. Once again, it only takes one here, and I think that is what the senior is looking for. 1-1 one, one pitch, big swing from Espinal. Gets him out in front. It's fouled back, but that evens the count out at 1-1. One and one. Alex Gonzalez, the, short, the starting shortstop, due up next after Espinal, the 8-hole hitter. 323 average down to the 8 hole. That one's laced into the right center field gap. Giving a chase is Gill, but it drops in. Lopez is going to score. They hold Silva at third, and a huge delivery from Justin Espinal. And guess what, folks? Now every hitter in the Jeff U lineup is up over 300. It is RBI number 27 on the year for the big DH. And that's one back for Jeff U. Our score 3 to 1. So Joshua Lopez coming around to score. Two hits now here in this top of the second inning for Jefferson University. And it's the second baseman, Alex Gonzalez, with runners on first and third. So that double play is still in order, but you have to worry about a run on any sort of wild pitch or passed ball. Silva very speedy over there at third base. Espinal 
has attempted three stolen bases on the season. He's been successful all three times. You might want to try and put a double steal in. That's a bunt offered at by Gonzalez, and he's late and fouls it straight back. So that is a strike finally for Matt Seaman. And it was it was close to the strike zone, but with Gonzalez offering at it, you'll take it. The count back even at one and one. Alex, not much of a power threat, but he does have six doubles and a triple on the season next to his one home run. That one misses outside. and Seaman, not necessarily wearing any sort of frustration here, but he was working very quickly back in the first inning. He's slowed down ever so slightly now as that strike zone has been hard to find continually here at Municipal Stadium. Late swing from Gonzalez. He fouls it back and another chance here for Seaman to get a put away pitch. Remember, you have the very speedy Gabe Silva on at third. Justin Espinal on at first. Three to one, the Eagles lead. But the Rams threatening. They've already pushed one across. Here's the 2-2 pitch from Seaman. Right down the middle, strike three. Gonzalez, all he could do was stare. It's the first strikeout of the afternoon for Matt Seaman. He came into action today with 45. Give him 46 now as he's only behind Joe Cristiano on the team. That comes at a giant time, retiring a hitter that was batting 323. Gonzalez strikes out for just the seventh time this season, and it all comes up to the center fielder, Jordan Tibercio. He swings early there, fouls it off the end of the bat. It will stay in foul territory. Tibercio playing in his 21st game of the season making his 12th start. Doesn't get a lot of at-bats. This is just his 31st AB on the year. He's in his freshman season out of Warminster. He went to William Tennant High. But he puts bat on ball there, and look at that. It drops in in front of Danny Gill. So I was implying that that's kind of a light hitter at the plate, proving me wrong. A slap single for Jordan Tibercio makes this a one-run game. Rams right back into it. It's 3-2. to two. So Tibercio with the base hit. That will score Justin Espinal, and the Rams go back up to the top of the order, and Justin Egner. Two runs now on three hits here in the top of the second for Jefferson. And Seaman walked Egner his first time up. That one misses up and in. So taking a quick check here on the pitch count. Matt Seaman, 38 pitches, 19 of them for strikes. That one does catch the outside corner. So there we go. Where my booth is here at Municipal Stadium, almost, I mean, like as close as can be to just right behind home plate. So you can tell... You can't tell height, but you can see where the pitch is coming in at. If it's on the plate, off the plate, inner half, outer half. You're going to get a lot of strikes on the outer half with this umpire today. He's very stringent on anything in. That one butted right back to Seaman. A lofted throw over to first, but he still gets the runner by a couple of steps. So Egner is retired on the ground out, but two runs on three hits and a runner left on base. We'll head to the bottom of the second inning. We might have a lot of offense today. It's game one of a doubleheader. Bottom of the second coming up, post three, Jeff U2.
So we're here in the bottom of the second inning at Municipal Stadium. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Del Sordo. You are watching Post University Athletics on the Nest Network. That's CACC Sports. And you can watch every game live on YouTube.com at Go Post Eagles. This is going to be the second inning of work here for Tyler Bem. Weren't quite sure if he was going to be an opener or just try and go as far as possible. He got out of the first inning with 25 pitches. 14 of them were strikes. This one is lifted to deep left center field. Going back on this Tiber CEO out to the track. And he makes the catch on the run. How about Hunter Keller giving that one a ride to deep left center field? And folks, it is so deep out here, especially in the power alleys at Municipal Stadium. There are a couple other ballparks here that that one would have gotten out in. And Hunter Keller, not robbed, but a big loud fly ball out for the first out of the bottom of the second. Danny Gill, that's a player who takes some home runs back out in center field, up next here for the Eagles. Danny, he's played in 37 of the 39 games this season. He started all 37 games he has played in. Still trying to get that average above the Mendoza line, but he's doing good work. He was at 166 two weeks ago, up to 191 now, and he's ahead of Bem in the count, 2-0. Three to 3-2 the score here in the bottom of the second inning. This is the nine-hole hitter, Danny Gill. Swinging 2-0, and that's a great play at third by Egner. Across the diamond, and Gill's a speedy runner, but there was no problem there. Justin Egner looking nothing like a true freshman there, scooping and retiring Danny Gill. And how n nice must this feel for Tyler Bem? 25 pitches, three hits, three runs allowed in the bottom of the first. Now he's thrown four pitches, and he's already gotten two hitters retired. We're back up to the top of the order, and Michael Pavelchak, who greeted Bem with a seven-pitch walk back in the bottom of the first. That one over for a first pitch strike. Bem a little extra on that. He lost his hat in the process. Both of these pitchers across the first inning and a half, a bit of laboring there. Pavel checked. That one stays fair. It takes a funny hop off the bag. And kudos to Chris McLean sticking with that one. And he's able to read the bounce up over first base. And uh-oh, this might be trouble here for Tyler Bem. He's out of this second inning. But he fell off the mound one pitch prior, and then it looked like on his way over to cover first, took a funny step off the mound. He's still bent at the waist right now. He's got the training staff out there with him. We didn't expect Tyler Bem to go all game, but that might spell his afternoon. But he does go 1-2-3 to get his team out of the bottom of the second. We'll head to the third inning. Eagles up one. It's 3-2. to two. Welcome back to Municipal Stadium in Waterbury, Connecticut. Time for the top of the third inning. Two, three, and four due up in the Rams' order. Chris McLean getting us started. McLean walked in the top of the first inning. He was retired when Josh Lopez grounded into an inning ending double play. Seaman gets that one back with a strike on the outside corner. I, I was attempting to make this point, and then there was a very quick ground out from Pavelchak back in the bottom of the second, but Siemens been been laboring today, and it got to him in the second inning. He only faced three batters in the top of the first. He walked two of them, but got himself out of the inning thanks to some great defense in Jimmy Brennan's arm. 
But he's already flipped the lineup over here, and that one coming right to me as it's behind Jimmy Brennan, and the count is back even at 2-2. Two and two. He's got to get through the meat of the order here, and unfortunately for Seaman, well, maybe fortunately for this inning, but looking forward, it was the bottom of the order that touched him up there back in the top of the second. He walked the first batter, Wood, back in the top of the second, who was then caught stealing. But Joshua Lopez singled, Gabe Silva walked, Justin Espinal hit an RBI base hit to score Lopez, and then after an Alex Gonzalez strikeout, the nine-hole hitter, Jordan Tibercio, with a base hit, scoring Espinal. So the Rams got two of those three back after allowing three post runs in the bottom of the first inning, and it's going to be a leadoff walk. Yeah, that is a leadoff walk on the play for McLean. So two ABs, two base on balls for Chris McLean, and fairly speedy runner out of the two hole on to get this inning started. Well, Seaman would love to repeat Josh Lopez's performance in the first at bat. We all would. This is such a threatening hitter in the dish right now. 340 on the year, 16 homers, 40 RBI. That was just his second ground into double play of the season. He takes a big swing ahead in the count 1-0 and fouls that one over the grandstands and probably onto Watertown Boulevard behind us here at Municipal Stadium. One of the preeminent power bats in the CACC. Seaman waits for the sign from Brennan. Even with the count at 1-1 one and, one, and he dots the outside corner there. The post dugout really getting into it here to try and get Seaman across the finish line in this Lopez AB. And he sees the light at the end of the tunnel here. One of the saving graces you have is Josh Lopez with that big power bat. He can swing and miss. 27 swings and misses on the season, and instead, with the count at 1-2, a plunk job. That is off the left shoulder and maybe the back of the neck for Lopez. He's on. Continuing the trend, unfortunately, for Matt Seaman. Now up into this point in the contest, he has walked five batters and has now hit one. Eagles still ahead on the scoreboard, but it's runners on first and second with no outs now, and the cleanup hitter, Marquise Wood. Chris McLean on at second, Josh Lopez on at first, and time for a mound visit. And this time, it's head coach Ray Scold taking the stroll. We do have action in the Eagles' bullpen, but they just got started. Out there is number 24, Nathaniel Bird. Be nice to see Bird get some action today. He celebrated his senior day earlier on this afternoon. For Seaman, up to this point in the contest, he's still playing that 50 50 ratio. He's thrown 48 pitches. 24 of them have been for strikes, but looking at the order here, he has faced 12 batters. He's recorded six outs, but there have been six combined walks or hit by pitches. So strike zone hasn't been friendly to Matt Seaman. The scoreboard, it's holding, but you're, you're working with a bend but don't break scenario right now here for Post University in the top of the third. Do up is the cleanup hitter, Mark Eastwood, and have to expect good numbers, but I'll relay them to you folks anyway. He is hitting 341 with eight doubles, a triple, and seven homers. Also, second on the team, no, pardon me, first on the team with 44 RBI, and second on the team with 74 total bases. Behind him, the other Joshua Lopez, who was one for one with a run scored today and who is hitting 345 with four homers and 37 RBI on the season. So, Seaman, you have a couple of big hitters across from you here with no outs and Wood doing what no one expected, showing bunt on the play. Brennan jumps on it. It's fouled back. And if nothing else, that gets Seaman ahead in the count and one pitch better in the ball strike ratio. 50th pitch of the afternoon coming up for Matt Seaman right here. No real big lead for either of the runners. They're not holding on Lopez at first. Jefferson University, you can hear their dugout there as that was a, a bit of a, a haphazard throw back to second. McLean looking at his numbers on the season. 
a solid base runner. He doesn't attempt to do it all that often. He's 5 of 6. Wood is a downright thief on the base paths. He's 29 for 30. Another bunch shown here for Wood, I'm sorry. And he fouls that one off, and you can see the look of frustration. He, two pitches that Marquise Wood, a 344, seven home run hitting hitter, has had to go through the bunt side. And he's he's done his job. He's offered bunt both times, but all that's gotten him now is behind the count 0-2. Huge opportunity here for Seaman to get his first out here in the top of the third. Brennan setting up on the outer half. 0-2 pitch is right there, and he gets him looking. Wood frustrated. I don't think that's with the strike zone. I think that's with the approach as he offers bunt, fouls it off two straight times, and then takes strike three. It's the second strikeout of the afternoon for Matt Seaman. Both of them have been K's looking, and now you have the possibility of an inning-ending double play with Joshua Lopez at the dish. But as we mentioned, Lopez, one of one, with a single and a run scored today. Cornwell not going to hold on to McLean. That one cuts back inside, and Lopez, he tried to check his swing. He did check his swing, but that ball just makes contact with the DeMarini, and it goes back to the backstop for strike one. Matt Seaman, not the most pinpoint pitcher by, by any stretch of metrics, but this is a bit uncharacteristic, this five-walk start that we've seen out of him up to this point. Coming into action today, he struck out 45 batters across from only 31 walks. He just got his second big strikeout of this contest and a chance for another one here against Joshua Lopez. Lopez does have 16 Ks on the season. That one's in on the hands. That's going to be a tough play for everybody. Rivera gets to it in time. Oh, the call is safe. The second base umpire, a long time before he made the signal there on the throw at first, it was truly a bang-bang play. Corchado still looking at the umpire now, maybe offering an explanation, but there you go. The hustle wins out for Joshua Lopez. He legs out that infield single, and the base is now loaded full of Rams for their halftime starting pitcher, halftime starting shortstop, Gabe Silva. So Lopez now two for two with two singles today. And this is your at-bat of the contest so far. Bases loaded, full of Rams. It's McLean on third. Josh Lopez on second. Joshua Lopez on first. And that one catches the outside corner. Matt Seaman, to his credit, he's more in the strike zone here in this top of the third. But with pitches over the strike zone, come hits and base runners. And the 0-1 pitch, that one's pulled well outside. Jimmy Brennan, a very solid defensive backstop for Post University. And we've seen one ball get past him, but a couple other stellar plays to, to, to keep runs off the board bluntly for Jefferson U. 1-1 pitch to Silva. Inner half. Silva was able to check the swing, but the umpire gives the called strike on the inside corner. So we'll try and do it again with Matt Seaman ahead of another batter all of a sudden. He's all over the strike zone, <laughs> and he's ahead of Silva, one and two. Silva, a 340 hitter on the season. He is prone to strikeouts. He's K'd 18 times. One-two pitch. Away, can't get Silva to chase. We've seen Seaman get a call on the inner half and get a call on the outer half. He's thrown two balls in the four pitches of this at bat, and for all four pitches, Silva, he, he's kept the bat on the shoulder. A discerning eye from a fellow pitcher, if you will. Matt Seaman delivers the 2-2 pitch. That one misses low, and will go full again with a count 3-2. and two. After Silva, it's the seven-hole hitter, Justin Espinal, who hit an RBI single his last time up. Both dugouts making plenty of noise here at Municipal Stadium. Brennan gets the sign. Seaman likes it. Comes set from the stretch. The 3-2 pitch misses low. And Gabe Silva works the walk to not this game back up at three. That was the 58th pitch of the contest for Matt Seaman. 
and he's just issued his sixth walk of the afternoon. It scores Chris McLean, and we're knotted up at three apiece. Justin Espinall, as I mentioned, one of one today, came come, coming into action, hitting 298, but with that hit, it puts him at a clean 300 on the season. He's looking for more first pitch swinging. That one lifted up and well out of play halfway into the bleachers down the first baseline. We're here at Municipal Stadium in Waterbury, Connecticut, and this is such a great kind of historical feeling field. There's only grandstand seating on one side of the field down the first baseline, but it's a large grandstand. It could almost double for football bleachers, if you will. Then we have this really nice angled press box that takes us right behind home plate. And then out down the left field line, you have a, a football stadium complex as well. So, you know, on a good day, you could have two different sports going on here. It's all post this afternoon and pretty rowdy crowd is family and friends all in town to celebrate this senior day. This one's grounded. Out at home is made on the throw from Corchado to Brennan. And Brennan had to drop down low to make sure he got that out. So no chance at the double play, but a smart play from Corchado getting the lead runner. And the score remains 3-3. And now it's going to have to be Alex Gonzalez to keep the inning alive. He struck out looking his last time up. So it's Espinal on at first, Silva at second, Joshua Lopez at third. This one in over the inside quarter, and Gonzalez, he was pretty animated after he struck out on three pitches his first time up. Another little glare back towards the home plate, um, home plate umpire as he's behind again in the count 0-1. Gonzalez hasn't started every game. This is his 26th appearance, his 21st start. That one's in on the hands. It's going to have to be a seaman catch. No, he's ran off at the last second by Corchado. Crisis averted because that one looked to be in Matt Seaman's wheelhouse. It goes in the foul territory, and his big first baseman bails him out. So another touch-and-go inning, and we are tied, but Seaman able to buckle down and avoid further damage. We've got a good one here, game one. Two seven-inning games on the docket today, and we head to the bottom of the third inning, knotted at three apiece. More after this on the Nest Network. So it's going to be two, three, and four here in the bottom of the third inning for the Post University Eagles. We got a good one here at Municipal Stadium. Some offense in game one on senior day as we're tied three to three. First pitch coming in from Tyler Bem. He's able to dot that inside corner, and you can see Cornwall looking back at the home plate umpire. I think, from our perspective, it looks as if this strike zone is expanding for, for both pitchers. Cornwall swinging, slashes this one down the left field line. It's angling out of play. It plunks the back wall of the post bullpen there, close to the catcher. He was the only one ready for that. And Cornwell quickly behind in the count, 0-2. Cornwell was out on a sack bunt his first time up. He was able to move the runner Pavelchak over from first to second. Pavelchak later came around and scored. 0-2 pitch. That one, though, right back up the middle, but it's there for Silva. Throw across the diamond, and he gets him by a step. 
You have that right-handed pitcher's arm out there at shortstop from Game Silva, and he was able to cover some ground too. I thought that one was a bit hotter off the bat of Cornwell up the middle. Silva cuts it off and gets the out by a step, and so Evan Cornwell now 0 for 2 on the day. And Chris Corchado, he singled and scored back in the bottom of the first. He's up again here. Chris was first pitch swinging his last time up and laced a single between short and third into left center. Behind in the count now, 0-1. Swinging here, and he tops this one to first. That's a nice play by the sophomore, McLean, and an easy cover. Well, we were talking about it right before the half inning started here. Tyler Bem probably was going to be an opener today, but he has really settled down in these second and third innings. He went 1-2-3, getting Hunter Keller to fly out to deep center field. Danny Gill grounded out, so did Michael Pavelchak. A ground out to Cornwell. And one to Corchado, and he's... Putting these balls over the plate to be hit. He's getting the Eagles to put them in play on the ground. And he has a solid defense behind him. Now that one misses low. Big opportunity here for Jimmy Brennan. Really where this whole, we'll call it, let's call it strike zone gate this afternoon got started was Jimmy Brennan struck out looking on a pitch over the outside corner. And then in the next half inning was, was able to, to, draw a strikeout on a Rams batter and it seemed as if he shared a laugh with the home plate umpire now we're in the third inning if something like that happens in the seventh inning I don't think any of us will be as as pleasant about it but as it is right now it has Brennan ahead in the count two and oh probably not the, the time to give him the green light but he's a powerful hitter here in the cleanup spot Bem takes a step off he'll reset the look here after Brennan it's DJ Karen had a big two RBI double, or an RBI double, back in the bottom of the first. This one lofted up, kind of in a no man's land, but when you have Gabe Silva out there, look at all the ground he can cover. Backtracking to about 230 feet away from home plate, and he's able to put the squeeze on it. So the second straight 1-2-3 inning for Tyler Bem, and the Eagles hoping Matt Seaman has the same thing in line. We'll head to the top of the fourth inning, all tied at three apiece. So we'll head into the top of the fourth inning, 9-1-2. Due up for the Rams here is Matt Seaman. In a game that looked like it might have been an offensive shootout, he is now kind of turning back into a pitcher's duel with Tyler Bem. The Eagles scoring three runs in the bottom of the first, and then their next six batters have been retired in the second and third. Ty Bercio quickly behind in the count, 0-2. He had an RBI single, his first time up in the top of the second inning. That made it a 3-2 game. And since Jefferson has scored one more to knock this back up at three apiece. Tiber Seo coming up off the bench for this start. A 233 hitter on the season. He scored 15 runs. 
in his limited appearances. That one just misses on the outside corner, and so we'll do it again with the count at 2-2. Two and two. Matt Seaman, 62 pitches to start the inning. That's pitch number 5, so he's up to 67. The split, it's, it's gotten better. 32 balls now to 35 strikes. So Seaman back ahead in the ball strike ratio, but he needs one here. 3-2 pitch coming. Yeah, and he just he kind of squeezed it too hard out of his hand. You can see it came out the way he wanted to, but he just pulls it off the outside corner. And so Matt Seaman still fighting along here for the Eagles, but that is his seventh walk issued in this contest. And you get a speedster down there at the bottom of the order, Ty Brasio, on it first, and adding, not in summary, but just, just making this that much tougher, you're back to the top of the order, and Justin Egner. He shows bunt here. There was the chance for the pickoff back at first, but Corchado having to cover the bunt, there was no, no real reality where he could have gotten his body back to first in time to apply the tag. Although Jimmy Brennan, to his credit, he's already thrown out two runners today. Seems very locked in defensively. And now Coach Horvath calling over his batter, Egner. Now we saw this happen, was it the last inning? Yes, that Marquise Wood came up with two runners on. That's the second best hitter average-wise. One of the most powerful hitters in the lineup, the cleanup hitter. And they gave him the bunt sign for the first two pitches. He found himself behind in the count, 0-2, after fouling off both of those pitches, and then struck out looking and wasn't too thrilled about it. You have kind of a similar setup here. Egner, 362 hitter, 34 hits, 24 RBIs, 37 runs scored, and they gave him the bunt sign. He offered at it. I, this is definitely a discussion of what they were doing, but makes you think maybe... He wasn't supposed to bunt. Now he's swinging away. The runner goes. And it will be a stolen base for Ty Brasio as it pops out of the glove of Brennan. So that's going to be the first stolen base here. For either team. As Ty Brasio was going on that play. Jordan now two of three stealing bags on the year. Chance, though, to put Egner away here with the 0-2 pitch. Bounces that one in. Brennan showing you the defense yet again. Story continues for Matt Seaman. That was just his 71st pitch of the afternoon. and He's thrown 34 balls, has issued seven walks. But still a chance to get out of trouble. This one's lifted to right. Pavelcheck coming in. Still coming in. Slides and he drops and it lands in safely. It was just in that, that awful in-between spot where you don't know if it's right to stay on your feet or try to slide. Pavelcheck kind of started the slide into that ball late. Got his glove around it, but it kind of pops out of the heel once he makes contact with the ground. It will be about as fluky as you can get, but a base hit for Egner. His first hit of the afternoon. And now Chris McLean, I mean, even, even in a world where he grounds into a double play, it gives the Rams the lead. And so this is the ultimate high-stress scenario here for Matt Seaman. Runners on first and third, no out, and the two-hole hitter Chris McLean at the dish. McLean, technically 0 for 0 this afternoon. He has walked both of his times up and in a good spot here. Ahead of Seaman in the count, 1-0. McLean, just a sophomore. Just like his high school teammate, Justin Egner. Second in average on the season, 352. and Leads the team in ABs with 128 now. Post wanted that call. Jefferson was willing the ump to keep it out, and that missed low. So the battle continues here for Matt Seaman. You have to think McLean's going to keep the bat on his shoulders. He's already walked twice in this contest. Runner leads off. Instead, what do I know? McLean swings, lashes it to Pavelcheck. The runner tags. We're going to have a play at the plate. Big throw from Pavelcheck, and he just quite can't get the out. But Brennan is going to gun down Egner, trying to steal second after the throw down. So let's see. Now they're going to check to see if the runner left in time. He did, so the run scores for Jefferson U. but how about that as a double play? McLean flies out to right, 
it will be a successful sack fly, but then an out on the base paths for Egner, that's probably an example of a freshman just getting a little too confident in what was going on. The run scores for Jeff Yu, but that's a great break for the Eagles. No base runners now and two outs in the nick of time as you have big Josh Lopez in the dish for the Rams. Okay, so let's, let's try and handle this on the score sheet real quick. It is a sack fly. Then Egner caught stealing, and there we go. 4-3 to three the score. That one over for a called strike. And there you go. Steven just seeing some good defense behind him. He's able to locate there. And another one. Lopez, so far today, he's grounded into a double play. And then he was hit by a pitch, just plunked right basically at the base of the neck and the back left shoulder. Behind the count 0-2 here. Seaman breaking ball, and it just kind of loops the strike zone. It started down the middle. It ends up off the plate, and it started too high to ever really catch that up-and-away corner. 1-2 and two now. Lopez up at the top of the conference with those 16 home runs on the season, but a big swing and a miss. Gets the Eagles out of any more trouble. It's one run on one hit, but a huge double play limits any more damage. We'll head to the bottom of the fourth with Jefferson U up one, four to three. Welcome back to Municipal Stadium. My name is Chris Del Sordo. You are watching coverage on the Nest Network. You can watch post-university athletics all season long on the CACC Network and at YouTube.com at Go Post Eagles. Well, it was a big start for post-university in this contest, taking a 3-1 to one lead in the bottom of the first. But three straight innings with runs scored for Jefferson University has them up one. And let's see what the middle of the order has cooked up here. DJ Karen getting us started in the bottom of the fourth. Five, six, and seven. Karen, Rivera, and Kelly do up. And it was Karen and Rivera with the two big hits in that bottom of the first inning. First, Karen with a RBI double. And then right after that, he came in on a two RBI single from Justin Rivera. Bem working quickly. And now a conversation here between Karen and the home plate umpire. I'm not sure if that was on the count or on location, but he's ahead in the count, two and one. Big swing there. Had the green light on the 2-1 pitch. This one is over the backstop end, off the roof, and out of play. Karen entering action today, leading post in a lot of offensive categories. 152 ABs leading the team, 52 hits leading the team, doubles and homers he leads the team, and he laces this one. This is over the head of the left fielder, and it will drop in off the base of the wall. Karen with a good jump. He's going to hold at second as Joshua Lopez didn't get over to that ball all that quickly, but... 
don't want to waste the opportunity to start off the inning with a leadoff runner on second. Big blast for DJ Karen. He's two for two today. First an RBI single, now a big ringing double that got over the head of Lopez and one hopped off to the base of the wall. This is how they got it done in the bottom of the first and here Justin Rivera, a big RBI opportunity. For DJ Karen, it's his team leading 12th double of the season. And Rivera, a good eye there as that one skips in to Josh Lopez. You, you really only see what Jefferson University has cooking in Division II baseball. When you get into, when you get into the, the high ends of D1, you're all everything 16 home run, 40 RBI hitter. Probably not going to be your everyday starting catcher, but they have that in Josh Lopez. Then you add in the Gabe Silva phenomenon where your arguably best defensive player, one of your best average hitters, is your starting shortstop, and then he comes in and he pitches every three games, and he has a 4-1 and one record and a 1.78 ERA. You can see why Jefferson University has twice as many wins as losses. There's a lot of good depth and an array of talent here, and you have these nine guys filling out this lineup Marquise Wood, if you look at his numbers on paper, you would have to think he's, you know, a Barry Bonds-esque power hitter. Instead, you know, he's a fleet-moving right fielder. You have Josh Lopez catching. Gabe Silva, you're starting shortstop at five foot four. Like, it's an unconventional look, but it's a very solid team out on the diamond here for Jeff Yu. 2-1 pitch here to Rivera. Chance to tie, and he lashes this one to dead center field. It sends Tiber Seo back. Going on the play is Karen. Tiber Seo gets it into the cutoff quickly, but there will be a throw. There won't be a play. And the sack fly for Rivera puts Jalen Kelly in a great spot here. He's been seeing the ball well lately. Has a speedy runner, Karen, on third with one out. Huge opportunity for Post to get the job done and tie this game back up here in the bottom of the fourth. Kelly flew out to dead center field his first time up. That pitch over for a first pitch strike. Kelly coming off of a five-hit doubleheader last weekend. Oh, and they got him leaning there. Over the outside corner, Kelly doesn't like it. The post dugout doesn't like it. Coach Scold not liking it at all, and he's standing up for his batter right now, 10 feet out of the coach's box. And I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I heard them. Terrible. Still saying it right now is maybe we joked about it, but the further you get into this game with that strike zone not being consistent, it turns into a problem quicker than you'd expect. 0-2 pitch, Kelly defensive swing to put bat to ball. Uh, there's a bit of a buzz right now in Municipal Stadium, and it's coming from the post-university dugout. After Jalen Kelly, it's Hunter Keller, the second baseman in the on-deck circle. He flew out to deep left his last time up. 0-2 pitch again to Kelly. He's able to fight that one off as it looks like Bem has just opted to the off speed here to try and put Kelly away, but but two very good defensive swings keep Jalen alive. Jalen in his senior season out of Naugatuck, Connecticut, went to Seymour High. That one up and away, and kind of see it on his body language. He must be seeing the ball well because he's been able to throw these late swings defensively to keep himself alive in this 0-2 count. He was spitting on that ball all the way. Gets him one back at 1-2. and two. That one laced into the gap. It's going to be a tough play for Silva. Throw across the diamond. Pulls him off board. Kelly stays at first. The run scores from DJ Karen. And we'll have to wait and see how that one was scored. For most hitters, it's an infield single. For Kelly, there was going to be a play at the first. I think it's going to be the throwing error that allows Kelly to reach. But the run scores. And so we're tied back up. Still only one out in the bottom of the fourth. And a runner on for Hunter Keller.
Hunter Keller now up with a 1-2 count. He, he hit a ball that in most other D2 ballparks would be well out, but it's 339. 339 down that, or pardon me, 349 down the line and left. And at the last second, Joshua Lopez was able to get to it. I mean, his back was, his back was almost at the wall. 2-0 now the count to Hunter Keller. That will be an RBI base hit for Jalen Kelly. And this one's lashed to left center field. Bat back on the ball again. Lopez back on the track, and he robs Keller again. Second A-B in a row. Your, your base runner. And what's going on here is Kelly off the base, and I think the Eagles are arguing for base runner interference on the play. I didn't have eyes on that. And let's see. Well, I'm, I'm hearing that's terrible from the post dugout, but we've, we've heard that a couple of times already today. I, I still don't know what Kelly could, could potentially be, be asking for here at first. Oh, the, okay. Keller hasn't left first base yet. The Eagles are saying that that ball was not caught by Joshua Lopez out in left field. I don't know if you guys saw anything different than I saw. It looked like he, he had it squeezed, but once again, I'm not out there. I can't tell in the post dugout. It's closer to left field than I am. And so right now, that's why Kelly was, was staying at first. Yeah, so this is going to be an interesting conversation. Both of these umpires are... Holding court here with Coach Scold, pleading his case. Technically, Coach Scold was the closest to that play out and left. Joshua Lopez, for the second time, had to backtrack all the way to the wall, and it's so deep out there and left to Rob Keller. But that's what it's going to be, a fly out to left field. And they're going to make Keller finally head back to the dugout. But an opportunity here for Danny Gill it will allow the Eagles to turn the lineup over heading into the fifth inning, but an opportunity to extend this one. So Kelly still on at first. Now two outs after another fly out to deep left field for Brady Keller. Have to think that, uh, pardon me, Hunter Keller. Third time Hunter's up. That's going to be maybe third time a charm if he gets one more whack here at Tyler Bem. Bem, to his credit, was able to shake off that, that, loud, that loud shot set in the left, and he gets back ahead of Gill, 0-1. And, and make it 0-2 as that one dots the outside corner. They didn't even have to appeal on the go-around. Gill, as we mentioned, offensively, it's, it's been a battle for him, but he's up to 191 now on the season. Jalen Kelly on it first. This one chopped that. Oh, over the head of Bem. It's going to be a tough play for Silva, but he made that look easy. Oh, my goodness, Gabe Silva. Another highlight play defensively, and he bails out his pitcher, Tyler Bem. So one run on one hit, one runner left on base. We got a great one here. Remember, we're only playing seven in each of these games. We head to the top of the fifth, tied at seven. Welcome back into Municipal Stadium. Four fun innings of baseball, and we head to the top of the fifth, tied at four apiece.
Big challenge here for Matt Seaman if he wants to continue his outing. He's up to 78 pitches, and he gets four, five, and six leading off the top of the fifth here. Marquise Wood, 0 for 1 today. He walked his first time up, and he struck out looking in his most recent trip. Huge swing there for Wood, and he comes up empty. Marquise, in his senior season out of Philadelphia, PA, went to Roman Catholic High School right there in the middle of the city. And enjoying just a phenomenal year coming in, hitting 344. Big swings there out of Marquise Wood. That one comes up empty, and you can see he's looking back at the home plate umpire as that ball was on the outside corner. He was wanted to confirm that it was going to be a called strike. So this is lovely to see for the Eagles with Seaman finding the strike zone and working quickly. 1-2 pitch. That's a swing and a miss. It's going to be a tough play for Brennan. No, it is not. He made that look so easy. Jimmy Brennan. And by the time he got to that ball, let's do some quick math. That's He's like 140 feet away from first base. And in one fluid motion, gets the speedy Marquise Wood. Remember, folks, Marquise Wood had 29 stolen bases coming in today. Gets him by a step. And making it even better, adding a little cherry on top. That's another strikeout for Matt Seaman. So the second strikeout of the afternoon for Marquise Wood, the fifth thrown by Seaman. That's the first strikeout swinging. The first four had come looking. Over on the other side, Tyler Bem only has 1K this afternoon, but he's got, to his credit, some great defensive help behind him. This is the five-hole hitter, Joshua Lopez, uh, the center of some controversy that, that snuck up us on, on us in that last half inning. It looked as if he made the catch against the wall on Hunter Keller. The Eagles dug out, arguing that no, he ultimately dropped that ball. And talking up here with our, with our scorers and our, and our video production staff, I, I think we all truly, we don't really, we can't tell you definitively what happened one way or the other. So it could be a pretty legitimate gripe here for Post University. They were able to push the run across, and now Lopez is even to Seaman with a count at 2-2. Two and two. Joshua just a true contact hitter, 345, 11 doubles, a triple, in total 38 hits. And he's only struck out 16 times of all the starters. The second fewest of the Rams this afternoon. Seaman, though, obviously looking for that put-away pitch. And he gets it right there. They dot the outside corner. Joshua Lopez doesn't like it. And they're, honestly, basically every other batter in this game on both sides has, has ended their AB with something to say to the home plate umpire. But two batters, two Ks for Matt Seaman. And God, this is going to look like a weird game on his box score once we're all done this afternoon. But he's up to eight Ks. No, pardon me. Seven walks, six Ks, tied in this game, and he's ahead of Gabe Silva now catching that pitch on the outside corner. Silva still technically hasn't registered an at-bat this afternoon. He's walked both of his two times up. This one should be a fairly easy play for Keller. That it is as he tosses it to Corchado. The fastest inning of work for Matt Seaman. Just what the doctor ordered. And we head to the bottom of the fifth. Tied in a good one here at Municipal Stadium. Rams four, Eagles four.
Welcome back to Municipal Stadium. Bottom of the fifth inning as we've started to work very quickly here from both of these pitchers. Tyler Bem, Matt Seaman in a uncharacteristic pitcher's duel, but this game has featured a little bit of everything. Bem, he's been a bit more efficient than Matt Seaman. He, that was just his 60th pitch. He got through the first four innings on 59, and he's been slightly more around the strike zone as well. That was his 39th strike opposite 22 balls. 1-1 one, one pitch here to the leadoff hitter. Michael Pavelchak takes a high hop. McLean gets it and gets to first by a step. That's a good-looking defensive first baseman there. And Chris McLean, we've seen him read a ball that is bounced off of the base. You have a, a pretty firm infield here at Municipal Stadium. So that ball can take some weird late hops. And he was all over that one, retiring Pavelchak for the first out of the inning. Evan Cornwell... 0 for 1 technically today. He had a sack bunt in the bottom of the first, and he grounded out in the bottom of the third. This one's lashed out into right, but Marquise Wood, if he wasn't shading him to right center, that one could have found the gap. Instead, Wood, he's got, got range. Speedy guy, and he's able to rob Evan Cornwell of the chance for extra base hits. In between innings, I said what a great opportunity this would be for the Eagles because they're at the top of the order with a pitcher who doesn't normally go this deep into games, and yet it looks like Tyler Bem has everything figured out right now. Two quick outs, and he's ahead of Corchado in the count, 0-1. Corchado, the team's leading hitter, 388 on the season. One for two today, bringing him up to 53 hits. In fact, Karen and Corchado tied atop the post leaderboard with 53 hits. Funny enough, you look at Jefferson University, a team that's played the same amount of games, their next closest player, their hit leader has 44. If Egner would have made that play, we would have been on a speed dial to ESPN up at Bristol because that, he covered so much ground just to get to that ball near the post dugout. It does land foul, and so it gives Corchado another opportunity, but behind in the count, one and two. The first inning was the big one offensively for Post. They pushed three across. Oh, slapped that into the gap. Another opposite field base hit for Corchado, and Bem is upset at himself there. I think he wanted to put that one even more inside as he tried to bust Corchado in, but a nice little display of defensive hitting keeps this inning alive, and it brings up the catcher, Jimmy Brennan. Jimmy today, 0 for 2. He struck out looking in the bottom of the first, popped out in the bottom of the third. But he is a 3-10 hitter strolling up to the plate. First pitch from Bem, first pitch offered at, lashed at, and it goes foul by about three feet for strike number one. If Brennan can reach, you have really the, the hottest hitter maybe in D2 baseball right now. DJ Karen due up. He's two for two today. Brennan right to Silva, and Silva is able to stick with it and get the out at second. If it's any other shortstop, you would think that maybe that first little flub would spell the end of the play, but we haven't seen Gage Silva make a mistake yet out there in the defensive infield, and another play brings us to the end of the fifth inning. Yeah, Matt Seaman going out for another. So when we come back, it'll be Matt Seaman trying to get the Eagles into the bottom of the six. We're all knotted up here at Municipal Stadium for a piece.
Matt Seaman just got through his fastest inning of the contest. He got done the top of the fifth in 10 pitches. Eagles hoping for more here. This next pitch to just Justin Espinall will be his 90th of the afternoon. Oh, and a little chin music to wake everyone up here as Espinall gets brushed off the plate. We've only had one hit batter. It was Seaman that threw that pitch. He plunked Josh Lopez in the left shoulder back in the third inning. Big swing right there from Espinall, and he comes up empty. Espinall got the big first hit in that rally in the top of the second that ultimately got Jefferson University in front was an RBI single, and he would later come around to score. This one's popped up. It should be a playable ball for Corchado. That it is, and no worries for Chris Corchado, about five feet out of fair territory. He'll put the squeeze on it for a big and quick out number one for Matt Seaman. Almost unfathomable to think about it, but I'll throw it out to the universe and see what the universe gives back. It took Matt Seaman 72 pitches to get through four innings, and yet, if he gets through... Gonzalez and Tiber Seo, 8-9, quick enough. You can realistically see an opportunity here for him to go out and try and finish this complete game. He's peppering the strike zone all of a sudden, which he hadn't been doing across the first three innings. And he's ahead of Alex Gonzalez, 0-1. Gonzalez is a difficult batter to strike out, and he struck out looking his first time up. Big swing there, and now everything Matt Seaman is throwing is blowing right by these Rams. He's ahead in the count, 0-2. Gonzalez, a 323 hitter. 21 hits and 65 at bats, so not a full slate of playing time, but he's making plenty of damage in his time to the dish. And yet, three walks, but only six strikeouts coming into action today. He's up to seven now, and Seaman would love to make it eight right here. Brennan, setting up over the outer half. Seaman delivers that one right back up the middle it's a tough play for Cornwall he dives to his left throw across the diamond not in time oh that's still a play for the highlight reel for Evan Cornwall but you could see Gonzalez busting it out of the box and for I mean that's hard to think that anybody is going to be thrown out there but Evan Cornwall he's the player at Cornwall the player to do it instead it will be an infield single for Alex Gonzalez and now a huge at bat coming up here for Jordan Tiber Seo. Let's see. Coach Scold not wanting to talk to his pitcher, Matt Seaman. Instead, talking to the umpire who made that safe call. I mean, there was a true bang-bang play there at first. So we're, uh, no problems from us up here in the press box. But this particular umpire has uh, drawn the ire of Coach Scold. We had the dropped ball in left situation. We had the balk that was a balk, then it wasn't a balk, then it was a balk again. And it, it, it's been not the home plate umpire, but, but this one out here at second that has really had to just wear kind of everything <laughs> uh, that Coach Scold has had to say. No change on the play call, and I don't think anyone expected that call to get reversed. And so for Gonzalez, that's his first hit of the afternoon. He's now one for three. On at first, Jordan Tiberseo won for two today with an RBI hit back in the bottom of the first. That one with some great late break on it as once again Jefferson tries to catch the Eagles napping with a first pitch bunt attempt. Bunted into the dirt. And it's Seaman ahead in the count now, 0-1. After Tiberseo, it's the top of the order and Justin Egner who is one for three today. That one pulled well off the plate to even the count back out at 1-1. One and one. And then after Egner, it's Chris McLean, who has made three plate appearances, but has yet to record an at-bat. McLean is two walks and a sack fly. 1-1 one, one pitch coming to Tiber Seo. It's over, but it misses high. And Seaman, a rarity over these past two innings. He's behind in the count to a batter, 2-1. and one. This is the 100th pitch of the game for Seaman. Tiber Seo swings and misses and a chance for a put away here for the big senior out of Valley Cottage, New York. This is senior day for Matt Seaman. There are plenty of players listed as seniors who will be coming back for another season for post-university. 
Matt, not one of them. Now, you do have the younger brother, Nick Seaman, waiting in the wings, and really, especially this year, turning into a, a premier pitcher right in front of our eyes, but this might not be the last home game for Seaman, but at least with his regular season look, a chance to make a statement. This has popped up a mile into the air. It's going to be a play for Rivera right on the line. That ball would have dropped into fair territory, but Rivera squeezes it for a big second out. Crazy to think that, that, that a, a batter with as small a frame as Tiber Seo could get a ball that high up into the air, but that's physics for you. It's a pop out. And back to the top of the order, and Justin Egner, we go. Egner, one for three today. But pardon me, technically one for two today. He walked his first time up. He was caught stealing after reaching base safely. He then grounded out to end the top of the second, and he did single in the top of the fourth. Another throwback. Rams have attempted three stolen bases today. They are only successful on one of those three attempts. Runners going, they'll get a chance for another one. And there's no throw to be had for Brennan because nobody was covering in time. Brennan popped up ready to go and maybe miscommunication or maybe just Keller couldn't get there quickly enough. Most of the time, most of the time, I, I, and, and I don't know if that's part of post system or not, but most of the time, regardless, you have the shortstop cover the bag on the throwdown. Now, th now, plenty of other teams have systems in place for what, what handedness the batter is, whether it's second or short that covers, but it looked like that was Keller's responsibility to cover, and that would have been a bang-bang play. Instead, Gonzalez steals second safely. Egner ahead in this count, 3-0, and oh, and this might be the one situation that, that you could see just a ball four given here because then that puts the force out back at every base. Let's see, maybe Egner will have the green light to counter that. No, that was, was not close to the plate. That was what Seaman had in mind. The eighth walk issued by Matt Seaman, and yet here we are in a 4-4 game in the top of the sixth inning. So a big AB coming up for the sophomore, Chris McLean. As I mentioned, three plate appearances, yet to record in that bat today. Uh, Eagles would love for him to maybe be first pitch swinging and just uh, put one into play lazily here. Egner on it first, Gonzalez on it second. That one spoiled into the dirt for ball one. This next pitch will be 108 in the contest for Matt Seaman, so it's hard to think regardless of what happens in the bottom of the sixth that, that, that you'll get another half inning out of him. Wow, that's another bow tie applied here by Seaman, and this time knocks McLean off the plate. And that's good. He won't be diving on, on, on anything over the outside corner, but he is behind in the count now to a powerful and capable hitter, 2-0. There is the aforementioned 2-0 pitch, and that one just catches the bottom corner. One back for Seaman, it's 2-1. There is action in the post-university dugout. I almost had the number. I'll try and get it back for you off the end of the bat. Easy read there for Danny Gill. He puts the squeeze on it, and the Eagles out of trouble here in the top of the six. So touch and go for a second with Gonzalez reaching scoring position, but Matt Seaman, 111 pitches, and he's through six innings of work. We'll head to the bottom of the six, a chance for the Eagles to put a mark on this one. We're all tied up for a piece.
DJ Karen back up to the dish for Post University. Two for two with an RBI today. We are dead square in this game. Four to four in the bottom of the sixth inning. Both teams, four runs on six hits. That one does catch the inside corner. But what I was saying is four runs off six hits at the same spot, but you, you couldn't have gotten there in, in two different routes between the route that Tyler Bem has taken versus the one that Matt Seaman has traveled down. Matt Seaman threw six innings on 111 pitches. He has walked eight and struck out six. This one has popped high up to left field. Coming in is Joshua Lopez, and he makes that catch rather easily. So that's a big bat extinguished by Jefferson. They got another one to deal with now in the form of Justin Rivera. Well, Joshua Lopez has certainly had an eventful game out there in deep left field. Still don't know about that ball that, that Kelly and, and the rest of the Eagles dugout that was hit by Keller that they swore it was dropped on the play. We're not going to have an answer for you for that one. I, potentially after the game, we can go back and try and find the replay. The Eagles did ultimately score in that inning. But if the ball was dropped, you have two base runners on instead of the one that came across to score. A chance for Rivera to turn it around, but he spits on that one and maybe shouldn't have. It dots the outside corner. And it puts Rivera behind in the count, one and two. After Rivera, Jalen Kelly do up. Big swing. Bem hasn't struck out too many. In fact, that's just his second strikeout of the afternoon. But what a time to get it. And it's two quick outs here in the bottom of the sixth inning. Jalen Kelly strolling up to the dish. One for two today. He hit that RBI single, an infield single. How about that for Jalen Kelly, his last time up to tie the game up at four apiece. Well, the ballpark scoreboard here uh, reads one out, but there are already two outs here against the Eagles, so Kelly, your last gasp between uh, a chance to put the game away in the top of the seventh or making that seventh inning really mean something. And remember, these games only scheduled for seven as we're playing two this afternoon here at M Municipal Stadium. Bem tried to get Kelly to chase... Figured, hey, I, I was just able to dot one ball on the outside corner there. Let me try again. That one, not all that close. And so Jalen buys himself another strike. Eight walks on the season for Jalen Kelly. Just three strikeouts. He's a tough batter to K. This one, Lopez has a chance against the fence. Oh, look at that catch by Josh Lopez. We talked about there's a pretty large backstop, some decent amount of room to keep balls in play behind home plate here at Municipal. And Lopez took advantage of that and made a very difficult play right against the chain link fence. And so we'll head to the top of the seventh inning. Money time here at Municipal Stadium. Probably not going to see Matt Seaman go out for his seventh inning of work. So when we come back, we'll fill you in on who is up next on the bump for the Eagles. Still all square at four apiece.
It's crunch time here at Municipal Stadium, and Matt Siemens' line is complete. Nathaniel Bird coming in here for the Eagles as we are all tied for a piece. Heading into the top of the seventh inning, Bird making his 10th appearance. All of them in relief. He has a 1-2 and two record with a 7.02 ERA. He's pitched 17 innings of work. He's unfortunately allowed 27 hits in those 17 innings, but more or less has kept himself out of trouble. Only 13 runs on those 27 hits. He's only walked 5 and struck out 16. So... Location, not a problem. Hitability, maybe. And he's got the meat of the order. Three, four, and five due up here for Jefferson University. It's Josh Lopez who just made a great defensive play leading us off. Bird's first pitch comes in a little high. And so Lopez out in front, 1-0. and oh. Bird in his grad season... Out of Wayne, New Jersey, a transfer from Bergen Community College. This one is skied over to Michael Pavelcheck in right. He takes two steps and puts the squeeze on it. So there's a nice big exhale as Nate Bird comes on and doesn't really give Josh Lopez anything to hit in those two pitches and forces that lazy fly ball out. Marquise Wood is a player right now who would love to turn his afternoon around. He walked his first time up, but was caught stealing for the first time this season. He struck out swinging and struck out looking, and he takes another one right over the middle of the plate behind in the count 0-1. Three forty one hitter coming into action today is Marquise Wood, and he's behind in the count quickly 0-2. Bird with a chance for his 17th strikeout of the season. And Woods third of the game right here. Breaking ball. Can't get it back over the plate there. A big looper. And the count at one and two. After Marquise Wood, it's Joshua Lopez, who is two for three today. That one. Slapped that. Are you kidding me? Nathan Bird barehanded. That ball was coming back about 100 miles per hour. And he stares it down with the pitching hand to get the huge second out here in the top of the seventh inning. A play to remember. Jack, you got to clip that one for his highlight reel. I'm putting that one on my highlight reel. And Bird, two quick outs here in the top of the seventh inning. And it's Joshua Lopez, the sophomore out of Nanuit, New York. The last man between Bird and a big inning in relief. And he snaps a breaking ball in on the first pitch to get ahead of Lopez. I guess that's going to be a G1 a G to Bird on the ground out from Wood. And a like ground out doesn't feel like the right, the right words to describe that play. One and one pitch coming in here to Lopez. Um, if you're just joining us, or if you if you weren't here at the beginning of the game, yes, there are two Josh Lopez's on this Jefferson team. They bat three and five, and they both are very threatening hitters in the right-handed batter's box. This is Joshua Lopez. He is the five-hole hitter who plays left field in his sophomore season. He's out in front of the count now to Bird, 3-1. and one. Bird out of the windup. Oh, that one right off of the elbow guard. You can hear that all the way up here, but that's why you wear them, right? Joshua Lopez can just wear that one, and he heads to first. Not in any real pain. Lopez, second on the team now, in hit by pitches. That's his fifth time getting plunked on the season. And Listen, any baseball team, they'll tell you, they, they love players who are able to put their body on the line, and you get a base runner here in the last inning, what's scheduled to be the last inning. You never know what that could lead to. Well, Bird's dealing right now with this overhand delivery. That one had some late run on it, and Silva just kept his bat on the shoulders. He's behind in the count, 0-1. Gabe 0-for-1 today with a ground out and two walks. No real lead for Joshua Lopez. Big swing for Silva and Bird. One pitch away from getting himself out of this high leverage situation. It's 8, 9, and 1 due up for the Eagles in the bottom of the 7th. Silva waits. The 0-2 pitch from Bird. Breaking ball. Oh, Brennan wanted it. It was a bit too far off the outside corner. Now we've seen a generous outside corner this afternoon from the home plate umpire. He doesn't give it there. And we'll try again now with the count one and two. 
Runner goes. Oh, it's a hit and run, and it's executed to perfection from Jefferson U. The throw across the diamond. I don't know if that's what the Eagles wanted right there. They almost do get the runner out in third, but instead, the first hit of the afternoon for Gabe Silva. What a time to call the hit and run with two strikes and two outs. You, you knew the runner was going to be going, but then it looked as if Lopez changed his mind. He ultimately decides to go for it. And then because he goes, nobody there in that gap in second. I, that ball probably was going to get through regardless, but a ringing single for Silva. Now you have Lopez on at third, Silva on at first, and the DH, Justin Espinal, stalking his way into the batter's box. That was the seventh hit of the contest for Jefferson University. We're almost kind of dead even in just stats for each team. It's four runs on six hits for the Eagles. Four runs on seven hits for the Rams, but huge situation right here is runners on first and third, and we have conferences happening from both teams right now. You can see head coach Horvath out there with, I believe that's Gunnar Hayes, the other coach, talking it over with both base runners and the batter, Espinal. Coach Scold off after his mound visit. And here we go. Justin Espinal, one for three today. He actually got a big hit back in the top of the second inning, scoring the first run for Jefferson U on an RBI base hit. After that, he reached on a fielder's choice and struck out swinging. So here's your matchup, Nate Bird versus Justin Espinal with two outs here in the top of the seventh. And that one is over the inside corner. No real big lead either way. So the 0-1 pitch coming from the stretch for Bird. Great defense there from Jimmy Brennan. Remember, you have Joshua Lopez on third. Not the fastest of all the players on this Jefferson University team, but with all the room that you have behind home plate here, if a ball gets past Brennan, it's going to be hard to get Lopez out. One one pitch, that one's fouled off late, and another chance for a putaway here as Bird is ahead of Espinal, one and two. Alex Gonzalez waits in the on-deck circle for Jefferson U. Just got his first hit of the afternoon in the last half inning. Bird comes set. Oh, they didn't see the runner in time. Oh, they... The second base umpire wasn't even turned around to look at that play. Now, granted, neither were two members of the Eagles. It was Brennan who saw that the runner was going. Bird steps off. They get the throw to second. The Eagles dugout not offering that much opposition, but I don't know. It looked as if the tag was there on Silva instead. Now one and two. Breaking ball! Dots the outside corner, and Bird says, don't worry about it, I got it. A pair of pitchers celebrating their senior day and putting Post in the position to take game one. We head to the bottom of the seventh. Remember, we're only scheduled to play seven, tied at four apiece.
Hunter Keller leading us off here in the bottom of the seventh. Remember, we are in a two-game doubleheader this afternoon, so we're only scheduled to play seven innings. We're tied at four, so you folks know what that means. If we end the seventh tied, we're going to head into extra innings. Hunter Keller has seen the ball very well out of the hand of Tyler Bem this afternoon. He's gotten robbed against the fence twice out in left field by Joshua Lopez. Behind in the count, 0-1. That one pulled from Tyler Bem. Have to think that this is the most pitches that Bem has thrown in an outing. That was his 80th of the afternoon right there. And here's 81 coming with a 1-1 count. Keller waits. The 1-1 pitch. Slam to third. Egner with a great play after the bobble across the diamond to his high school teammate McLean for the first out here in the bottom of the seventh. So Keller, once again, looks like he's seeing the ball well out of the right hand of Bem, but not rewarded on the base paths. And the Eagles will flip the lineup over with the center fielder, Danny Gill. Gill is grounded out twice this afternoon. Lifts this one high to center field. Ty Bercio started back. He's racing in. Wood calls him off. And at the last second, it's Marquise Wood closing the gap and putting the squeeze on it for the second out. So the Eagles, I mean, you'll take the blessing with the curse. It is two quick outs here in the top of the seventh. But now you've turned the lineup over and you have your leadoff hitter, Michael Pavelchak, celebrating his senior night today with a chance to set the table if crazier things happen, maybe put an end to this ballgame. First pitch to Pavelcheck. First pitch swinging, and he laces this one over our heads, not a play foul. Siemens' night ended with, what, 111 pitches, 61 of them for strikes, 50 balls. Bem has put the ball over the plate today, and this one's lashed at by Pavelcheck, but it's read well by Ty Bercio. Didn't have to move all that much to put the squeeze on it. Well, go, go and figure. We decided to play two today, so we'll play extras in the first. We're heading to extras, top of the eighth inning. We'll get another look at Nate Bird here. The score still as it's been ever since the fourth, all knotted up at four apiece. So we are in extra innings this afternoon here at Municipal Stadium. It is the top of the eighth inning here in game number one. Four runs on seven hits for the Jefferson University Rams. Four runs on six hits for the Post Eagles. And that's a rude start to the, ex to the top of extra innings as Gonzalez just smacks his second base hit of the afternoon right past Bird and into center field. So Gonzalez now two for four. Nice way to set the table for the nine-hole hitter, Jordan Tiberseo. Tiberseo on. Wow, the third baseman, Rivera, about 60 feet away from home. He knew the bunt was coming, and the bunt sent in foul by Tiberseo. After Tiberseo, it's the top of the order. Justin Egner, who is one for three today. Chris McLean, who is 0 for 1, 
And then Josh Lopez, who is 0 for 4 in his four at-bats this afternoon. 0-1 pitch. That one butted right back to Bird. No play at second. Throw to first. Got it easily with that's Keller over there to cover. One out, but a runner in scoring position as we go back to the top of the lineup. And Justin Egner. Oh, and one pitch. That one. Oh, that one misses high. Chance there for Bird to get himself in put away position, but it's even at one and one. Egner, as we mentioned, coming into action today, leading all hitters for the Rams with a 365 average. That one into the dirt. Great play again by Jimmy Brennan. He has shown just A plus defensive ability from the catcher spot. This afternoon. Let's see if they give Egner the green light here. Speedy runner on Gonzale on second in Gonzalez. Egner ahead in the count 2-0. They might have given him the green light. He, he flinched at it, doesn't offer at it, and it is a called strike on the inside corner. Looking at Bird's numbers, nine appearances, 17 innings pitch coming in. So... You know he can go two, maybe go three. Pickoff play. They had it. Oh, no, and it gets past the center fielder. Let's see. Gonzalez is speedy, and that's a bad look right there for Danny Gill. Not a bad look in him covering the play, but it gets through him, and that bad body language lets Gonzalez get around with that much less of a throw. Heartbreak on the pickoff attempt as it's an unearned run coming, or, well, yeah, no, it is. It will be an unearned run coming across. We haven't had an error yet in this ball game. Heartbreaking time to see it come from post, but Jefferson U up five to four. Let's see how Bird can react to that. Oh, it's laced over the middle, giving chase out in center field, but not being able to get there in time is Danny Gill. He picks it up, but it's going to be a double for Justin Egner, his second hit of the at bat. The Jefferson University cheering section making plenty of noise. So is their dugout. All of a sudden, Bird, who looked untouchable in the seventh, getting touched up here. One run, two hits, and now McLean. Not a chance to bust this game open, but a chance to, to extend this lead. First pitch of the at-bat, breaking ball, misses high, and with every miss right there, you can hear... the dugout getting that much more into it. So the run scores on the pickoff error. A two-base error allows Gonzalez to score. Then Egner hits the double. And now he's got his high school teammate, Chris McLean, up with a chance to send him in with one out here in the top of the eighth. Oh, the umpire gives that inside strike call a about a full beat after that call should have been made. Eagles love it. Rams hate it. We've seen that from this strike zone this afternoon. Bird will definitely take it as he's back in this AB 2-1. and one. Delivers. Misses wide. And now McLean has himself in a great spot here. If they make you keep your bat on your shoulder, you know that Josh Lopez is waiting in the on-deck circle, but he might as might get a green light here with a 3-1 count. Bird delivers. Bird misses inside. That's the first walk issued by Nate Bird this afternoon, and it puts two runners on. Now, though, you do have two separate double plays in order as Josh Lopez strolls to the dish. Lopez... 0 for 4 this afternoon. Probably has had the, the, the roughest offensive game of any Jefferson U Ram, and that's so surprising considering his numbers coming into action today. 340, 16 dingers, 40 RBI. You know, you're playing with fire with him every time he comes to the plate. Seaman had answers for him. Let's see if Bird can deliver similarly.
runners not taking that big of leads. Eagles are not holding on the runner, Egner, at second. That one misses, and now Bird in a bit of a battle with the strike zone here. Unfortunately, it looks like that, that failed pickoff play has kind of crept into his psyche a little bit now. You can't fall asleep here and put one right over the plate. If anyone will make you pay, it's going to be Josh Lopez. But instead, a huge swing on that one running outside of the plate. He asked for a timeout here to collect his thoughts, and it looks like he's also fixing that wrist guard. Yeah, it has been an uncharacteristic offensive showing for Josh Lopez, but he's the starting catcher as well for Jefferson University, and to his credit, calling a heck of a game, getting this reliever, this opener, Tyler Bem, seven innings deep, and he's also made a heck of a catch right up against the chain link fence here on the backstop. So making up for the lack of offense with that glove, that one misses outside, and he might have the greenest of green lights here with a 3-1 count. Definitely going to be looking for his pitch to drive. Justin Egner on at second. Chris McLean on at first. Alex Gonzalez just scored the go-ahead run on a pickoff error from Nathan Bird. And now here's the 3-1 the to Lopez. A huge swing from Lopez. He has swung out of his shoes both swings he has taken this A-B. And Bird has this back full. After Lopez, you have the cleanup hitter, Marquise Wood, who's 0 for 3 with a walk this afternoon. It's a similar scenario to Lopez. It's a hitter that hasn't shown a lot today, but you know is always going to be a threat at bat. That one fouled off way back into the stands down the right field line. Lopez takes his time back to the box. Bird was definitely more around home plate, around the strike zone. Back in the top of the seventh here. Had some issues in the bottom, or top of the eighth. And there's an ultimate issue right there. High, deep, and gone. Way gone for a team leading 17th time this season. Josh Lopez clears the bases. It is a three-run big fly. And this game, which had just been seemingly tied at four forever, has been turned on its head here in the top of the eighth. Lopez is team leading 17th home run of the season. RBI 41, 42, and 43. And it's a four-run lead for the Rams here in the top of the eighth. How quickly the game can change now is Bird. There was, there was no outs when that play to Gonzalez happened. And he was able to scrap out one, one out on the Tiber CO ground out. But it just seems like that was going to be the end result of one of those ABs. And Bird, to his credit, as he drops in just a beautiful off-speed pitch there for strike two was much closer to the strike zone throughout the entirety of the seventh inning and then wasn't anywhere near it until he needed to throw some strikes against Lopez and Josh was saddled up on one. It's, it's a big ballpark. It's slightly deeper to left than it is to right. Regardless of whatever the fence dimensions are, that ball was going to leave any park at the D2 level. This one slashed foul by Marquise Wood to even his count back out at 2-2. Two and two. And so, making matters worse here for Nate Bird, you have Wood, the cleanup hitter. Another power hitter in Joshua Lopez due up next. And that one can't catch the outside corner to make the count full three and two. Bird waits for a sign from Brennan. Full count pitch. Swung on, fouled directly off the mask of Jimmy Brennan, so we'll have to do it again. Plenty of velocity there to try and bust that one past Marquise Wood. He was able to just stay with it. And we'll do it again. Might be a time for one of those patented Nate Bird breaking balls. Instead, he tries to beat him with a fastball, misses inside. And still only one out here in the top of the eighth inning. This time, it's Joshua Lopez.
10 walks issued now by the post-university pitching staff. Eight thrown by Matt Seaman. Now two here for Nate Bird. We have action in the bullpen, and we have a new pitcher coming in. So we'll take a break here on the Nest Network as the Eagles try and get themselves out of trouble here in the top of the eighth inning, trailing 8-4. to four. We're back here as Alexander Galvin tagging in for Nate Bird. Still just one out here in the top of the eighth inning. And a springy Marquise Wood waiting on it first. That one misses just outside to even the count out at one and one. Joshua Lopez at bat here for the Rams. The seventh different batter at home for the Rams here in the eighth inning. Galvin coming into action today, making his seventh appearance. He has an 0-2 record with a 9.7 ERA so far on the season. Another throw over there. It doesn't look like Wood seems too willing to run, but Galvin trying to keep him off balance. Alex has allowed 18 runs, 17 of them earned, on 26 hits so far. 
That one misses outside. Throw down for Brennan, and the tag is too late. Once again, the arm from Brennan on display. As he got that one down there so fast, but the, the late slide in the nick of time for Marquise Wood. He's already gotten caught stealing once. I'm sure he didn't want to flirt with that happening a second time here. But he's back safely. And here's the 2-1 pitch to Joshua Lopez. Gal looks from the stretch. Uh, he took so much off of that pitch. It just seemed to float on in. And Lopez couldn't quite hold the bat back long enough. He's out in front to even the count back out at 2-2. Two two. Galvin likes to pitch to contact. He's only struck out five batters so far on the season, walking eight. 2-2 two -two pitch, step off. Wood knew it. He's back at first. After Lopez is Gabe Silva, who we're speculating might be the game two starter on the mound for Jefferson University. And Jack and I were talking about this. He doesn't even really need to do a proper warm-up after you play eight innings of baseball right before that. He's in the on-deck circle. We don't know who Jefferson U is going with in, in game number two, but with these runs coming across here in the top of the eighth inning, your opener, your bullpen reliever, Tyler Bem. Very well might get a complete game win this afternoon, which not something any of us bargained for, especially after we saw Post-University score those three runs to get the game started in the bottom of the first. If you're just joining us, Post took a 3 to nothing lead in the bottom of the first. Jeff Yu chipped away with two in the second, one in the third. They took the lead momentarily, 4-3 to three in the top of the fourth. Post tied it back up with a Jalen Kelly RBI infield single to make it 4-4, to four, and we were there across the fifth, sixth, and seventh, now in the eighth inning, a run off of a pickoff error scored by Gonzalez, and then Bird serves up a moonshot three-run home run to Josh Lopez, his team-leading 17th homer of the season. And that has us at eight to four. We are still on one out here as Lopez just offers it that one, coming in so soft from Galvin. It was over the strike zone. He sends it out of play and foul. So the count stays at 3-2. and two. We mentioned Silva on deck. In the hole is Justin Espinal, who got his day started with an RBI single. He's gone 0 of 3 since. That one over the plate. It'll drop down in front of Gill. And another ball through Danny Gill. And another error allowing a run to score. And this will send... Lopez in safely at third. Jefferson's dugout loves it. Five consecutive runs with no outs recorded for the Rams offense. And now they have a 9-4 lead with a chance to make it that much more as you have Lopez smiling on safely at third. How about that note right there? With that 17th home run of the season for Josh Lopez, he is now second in all of Division II baseball with his 17 home runs. Not a cheapy, folks. It's hard to get them out over the fence here at Municipal Stadium, and we'll take the tape measure out there eventually. This one outside off the plate here for Gabe Silva. We had a clean game of baseball going until we reached extra innings. But we had the error on the pickoff play, and now that error out in center field from Gill allowing the run to score, and Galvin trying to get the Eagles out of trouble. Sends that one in wide. It'll be two, three, and four due up for the Eagles in the bottom of the inning. That one is off Galvin. It takes a funky hop. Oh, it's picked up by Keller. Throw across the diamond, and they can't get the out in time. And now you got to check on Anthony Galvin because that was close to his fielding wrist or his pitching hand. It's the 10th run coming across here in the top of the eighth inning, and you have Justin Espinal now looking to make his day a little bit better here with a runner on safely at first.
So Gabe Silva now two of three today with a pair of singles. That's his first run batted in of the afternoon. Just a dream scenario here in the eighth inning for the Jefferson University Rams. Galvin on the mound facing Espinal. That one misses wide. No real lead from Silva on at first, as we've seen Galvin. He's been very worried about those base runners. So much taken off that pitch. He gets Espinal way out in front, and all Espinal can do is just kind of smile at himself there as the count is back even at 1-1. One and one. We came into action today in the CACC with both of these teams at the top of their respective divisions. The Eagles, 13-5 and five in... CACC play, having them leading the North Division by a game and a half over Felician. Dominican third, Caldwell fourth, and Bridgeport fifth. Bloomfield technically sixth. They're not playing any games in the CACC this year. There's an off-speed pitch, has Espinal out in front, and Galvin one strike away from his first put out here as he's ahead of Espinal one and two. Jefferson U, 12 and five. They have Goldie Beacom a game and a half behind them. Wilmington U, Third in the South, Holy Family is fourth, and then Chestnut Hill College rounding out the five in the CACC South Division. So we were talking about it up here in the press box before action got started this afternoon. This is a giant set of games for both teams. If either one of these teams sweeps these two games, they, they're more or less stamping their spot atop their division and potentially atop the entire CACC. But as we mentioned both of these teams only a game and a half in first place. So whoever loses, if you have one team losing both games of this doubleheader, well then, you have a lot of work to do all of a sudden from what looked to be a comfortable spot. There are going to be three games on the schedule for post that we're not counting into that 13-5 and five yet that will be wins against Bloomfield. Jefferson U doesn't have that same luxury, but with... with under a week remain, or, or almost down to a week remaining in CACC play, you can't really wash away any loss at this point. Espinal, he really wants to get himself a base hit here as Galvin is just toying with him. Off-speed pitch after off-speed pitch with not much to hit. But he's ahead in the count here now, one and two after getting Espinal to foul that one off. The runner, Silva, leading off of first. That one's sent in outside. Two two pitch coming. That one's right there. It's cue ball off the end of the bat, and it gets past Corchado after the dive. Runner. Being sent to third on the play, Espinal holds it first. It's uh, the softest hit of the afternoon, but yet another one as the hit parade continues here for Jefferson University. Score still 10 to four, but now runners on first and third. Alex Gonzalez led off this inning with a single to right field. He later came around and scored on a pickoff error. And that felt like yesterday at this point. He's back up again for his second time here in the top of the eighth inning. Six runs on six hits so far here and only one out recorded. That strike is given to Gonzalez. A bit of a wry smile as he looks back up towards his dugout, but it puts Galvin ahead in the count now 0-1. Pickoff play, Espinal back safely. Espinal has only attempted three stolen bases on the year. Mentioned that he is a perfect three for three. After Gonzalez, Jordan Tiberio, the nine-hole hitter, due up. He's waiting in the on-deck circle.
One and one the count here to Gonzalez. As it's Espinal leading off third. That one. Not given. It was too low. And so now Gonzalez in a hitter-friendly count. Galvin waits, 2-1 pitch, that's sent in, and a break late on that, catches the outside corner, and so it's the third straight batter that Galvin's gotten himself into a two-strike count against. Not expecting Espinal to run on the play. Silva with some speed, they throw back over to make sure Espinal doesn't run, and Admittedly, a bit of a lull has come over the crowd here at Municipal Stadium. We had a great baseball game, especially at the fourth inning when it was 4-4 four to four and it looked like there was going to be offense forever. This one's popped up. Keller waves everyone off, takes three steps back, puts the squeeze on it for the much-needed second out here in the top of the eighth inning. And then, once we transitioned into the fifth inning, both pitchers completely found their groove, settling in, retiring batters with ease. We headed into extras with a 4-4 four to four contest. And Bird coming in for his second inning of work, and he looked great in the seventh inning. And then, what did it take? It was an error on a pickoff throw, and that led to the dam breaking, if you will, here in the top of the eighth inning. Tiber CO, the nine-hole hitter, he's up. He takes that one. Right over the outside corner there for strike one. Galvin from the stretch, fakes the throw off to first throw at home, and it is safe. Jefferson University, they've done a little bit of everything in this eighth inning, and now they can say they have stolen home. They were playing with fire with all those pickoffs over to first, and Galvin, it's not as if his pace is deliberate, but he, he's not throwing the ball hard over to first base. And Silva, I mean, fool him once, shame on you. Fool him twice, shame on me. He let he let Galvin do it 11 times before he finally took the base that they were basically giving to him. It is the seventh run in the top of the eighth inning. And it just it's just crazy to think that we've gotten to this point in this game now that a steal of home, it, it, it's not surprising. The way that this game has just unfolded and what a way to scratch across another run. The way Tyler Bem has been pitching, especially these last four innings, you would think that he was going to go up there and go one, two, three in the bottom of the eighth regardless, but now you're giving him seven runs of insurance. I think the Eagles' defense is, is reaching maybe their breaking point as well as we've seen a couple of misplays here. Save for the pickoff error. Then another error out in center field. And this one slapped up the middle for a base hit. And the Rams are sending the runner. He will score. They're really, really piling it on here. Is Jefferson University in this eighth inning? It is their seventh hit. And their eighth run scored in this eighth inning. And the line keeps on moving. This will be the 12th batter of the inning for just, in Justin Egner. Slow walk to the mound here for Coach Skoll. It looks like it's going to be time for a pitching change. So time for a break for us here on the Nest Network. Two outs here in the top of the eighth inning. It's all Jefferson University. Rams 12, Eagles 4.
Well, there are two outs here in the top of the eighth inning, but Post eh, still got to get one to, to close the door here as it's been eight runs off seven hits here. It all got started off of an ill-fated pickoff throw that allowed Alex Gonzalez to score from second. And ever since that point, Jefferson is... They found the break in the dam. They've busted it open, and now they're just trying to run up this count. That one in for a strike, but Brennan can't squeeze it cleanly. This is Noah Connor into the game for the Eagles. One of the players who celebrated his senior night, senior day, because the, cel the ceremony happened before we got started today. Noah in his grad season out of West Springfield, Mass., he went to Pioneer Valley Christian High. He's ahead of Egner in the count 0-2, 0-2 pitch. That one misses outside. The runner on second is Jordan Tiber Seo and hasn't seen all that much playing time this season. He's, he's a fast runner. He's only attempted two stolen bases. One for two on the year. 1-2 pitch. That one's lashed at by Egner. Over the net and out of play foul. Connor... In five appearances this season, has a 1-0 and record. He's pitched seven innings of work in his five appearances. Has allowed 12 hits, eight runs, and all eight of them earned. Tries to throw it back to first, and doesn't throw it to anybody in particular. Right between Cornwell and Keller. And the dugout, the post dugout with, with uh, it sounded like somebody was yelling something over towards the Jefferson U dugout. Jeff U trying to make it a nine spot here in the top of the eighth inning. One, two pitch coming to Egner. And that one misses high. So we'll do it again with the count two and two. Connor. That one is ripped, lifted to left. Pushes Karen back at the wall, over his head, and it one hops off the wall. It will be a ninth run scored in the inning for Jefferson University, who doesn't have anything else to prove in this contest, but they can make this win look, or th this result, look that much nicer in black ink as they just scored their ninth run here in the top of the eighth inning. They don't show any intentions of slowing it down here. As Chris McLean strolls back to the batter's box. McLean yet to record a hit. He's walked three times, though, and has a sack fly. So, technically, he's sitting at 0 for 1 on the afternoon. Runner on, the, runner on its second is Justin Egner. Has him at 2 for 3 today. This one's lifted out to left center field. Should be a fairly easy play for Karen. He has to come in a couple of steps, and he puts the squeeze on it to bring us to the bottom of the eighth inning. But nine runs on eight hits and one post-university error scored by the Jefferson U Rams. The Eagles will try and take their wax at it here, trailing by nine. When we come back, it'll be the bottom of the eighth inning. Rams 13, Eagles 4.
Big swing on the first pitch, and that's going to get the Eagles started off well. Evan Cornwell is first base into the afternoon as he's first pitch swinging on the new Rams pitcher, Joey Azara. And so it's a big hit there for Cornwell as the Eagles... All you can do is head up to the plate and just try and hit away here. They allowed nine in the top of the eighth inning to Jeff Yu. Remember, we were scheduled to go seven. This game was tied four to four at the end of regulation, quote unquote. Then nine pushed across 13 different batters, took ABs for the Rams in the top of the eighth inning. Corchado back to the dish for the Eagles. Chris, two for three today with a pair of singles and a ground out. This one on the hand. Silva, it was just in front of him on the in-between hop, and he tried to backhand it. Couldn't do it, and that one gets through. And so we're not going to put any cart before any horse here, but two batters, no outs, two base runners for Post University. Might this be a similar situation? Azara coming in for the Rams, only making his sixth appearance of the year. He has pitched 11 innings of work, allowing 11 hits. Great breaking ball there to come back in and catch the inside corner on Jimmy Brennan. Brennan 0 for 3 today. Shows a good discerning eye there and takes that one outside. After Brennan, it's DJ Karen and Justin Rivera do up. That one cuts in with some late break. Brennan puts a late swing on it and fouls it out. Azara now ahead in the count, one and two. Joey Azara in his sophomore season from Collegeville, Pennsylvania. He is a friar from Malvern Prep High. That one sent in foul by Brennan. Jimmy with a 3.10 average coming into action on the season. Big looping ball there by Azara. Misses well wide. And here we go. Brennan trying to get himself back in this AB. Joey Azara, even in the count, he's gotten allowed the first two base runners on. A hit and then a Gabe Silva error allowing... Corchado to reach this one on the hand, sent down the line, and it goes foul. I think an extra base hit here would be just what the doctor ordered for the Eagles. And Brennan has 11 of those on the season. This one misses wide, and so a big pitch coming up here for Azara. If Brennan reaches here, that would bring up DJ Karen, who's two for three today with the bases loaded, and he does just that. Slaps this one into left field. The runner, Cornwell, held at third. So the Eagles go station to station out here in Municipal Stadium. The first three runners in this inning are on, and now Karen has an opportunity here against Joey Azara. And he's already two for three on the day. Cornwell and Brennan... On with singles. Corchado reached on an error by Gabe Silva. And now Azara can't find the strike zone with that one. And it's an entire infield mound visit here for the Rams. So we're back here, the count 1-0 and oh to DJ Karen. That one in on the hands, he fouls it off. There is kind of a standard bearer in the bullpen for Jefferson University. Azara isn't part of it. No one else warming up, though, in that bullpen down the right field line for Jeff Yu. Only two pitchers, Abixayel Sosa, 
with a lower ERA. That's a brilliant play on the throw to second. The Eagles trying to argue the throw on the force. Let's see, they're, they're arguing that the foot came off the bag with both the home plate umpire and the second base umpire. I don't seem like they're gonna spend too much time on this conversation. The run does score on the fielder's choice. Brennan, he's holding his spot there at second. He's not, he's not coming off the bag until they tell him to. And finally, it's Coach Scold that's pulling him off the bag. We have some we have some eyes on that play right now, and from our camera angle, we, we can't tell you that there's anything definitive either way. But give the force out at second. It's a big first out of the inning for Jeff Yu. One run scores, and the score now 13 to 5 here in the bottom of the eighth. Remember, this is game one of two scheduled seven inning games. Rivera late swing on that one. Azara, to his credit. The numbers haven't necessarily been there for him this season, but you can see the stuff, a lot of velocity coming out of that right hand of Azara. Rivera had that one lined up, misses it just underneath. And a chance for a put-away pitch for Azara here with the count one and two. Pickoff play, Karen back easily. Karen, two more RBI today, extends his team lead up to 28 on the season. You get, That right there is a case study in the difference between these two teams. Post has three players with 52 or more hits on the season. But their leading RBI man has 28 ribbies. Meanwhile, Jefferson U doesn't have a player with more than 45 hits, but they have... Five batters with at least that many RBI. This one's laced into right field. This one might get over the head of Wood, and that it does. So Rivera scores the runner from second. He'll cruise into second with a double. Karen had no real chance to read that jump, so he has to stay at third. But some offense continuing for the Eagles. They push, push one more across on the Rivera RBI double. Rivera has three RBI today for the Eagles, and it's a 13-6 to six game. Karen with three ribby, two for Rivera, one here for Jalen Kelly. He had an RBI infield single that knotted that game back up, knotted this game back up at four apiece back in the fourth inning and felt like we were in a different world back then, to be honest, before we had this nine-run explosion by Jeff Yu in the top of the eighth. Big swing there from Kelly. He's out in front. Had a warning just issued to one of the dugouts. And it was uh, the situation diffused immediately after that point. Kelly, big swing there, lofts this one foul. It's up out of play. And almost a great catch made by the fans out there in right field. He made the, the subsequent catch on the rebound. Kelly gets to line it up again with a count one and two. Eight walks on the season for Jalen Kelly. 13 strikeouts. The umpire stepped off to, to, to say something to Joey Azarov. He's quickly back into his setup. That one's in on the hands, and this one will get in over the head of the second baseman. Karen walks in to score. Station to station baseball. Hold everything, folks. It's a six-run game. 13 to seven. Two runners on still. And still just one out for Hunter Keller. So for Jalen Kelly, that's his second RBI single of the afternoon. And Hunter Keller, here's a batter who has uh, sent two balls to the wall this afternoon. He's 0 for 3 with two fly outs and a ground out. First pitch, offers at it. Wow, and both umpires say he held his swing. So never mind, count is 1-0. and Hunter in his junior season, he's a Connecticut resident from Oxford, Connecticut, and he went to Oxford High. That one misses up and in. And let's see, taking a look over here to the bullpen, there is one player uh, just starting to get loose over there. 
I can't quite make out the number. I don't know if you guys can from that angle, but it looks to be a righty stretching up for Jefferson Ewan. They might have to tag him into the game. This is cued off the end of the bat for Hunter Keller over the head of the first baseman, McLean, in the right field. Another run scores for the Eagles. What a rally developing here in the bottom of the eighth inning. It is 13 to 13-8. Runners on first and second and still just one out. And now the Eagles get to turn the lineup back over with Danny Gill. Those last two hits, balls not hit well in, by any stretch of the imagination. Kelly was in on the hands. Keller was off the end of the bat. They both get through. And now Azara looking for answers, and he might get it right here. Silva to Gonzalez. Safe at first. So hold that thought. It was a centimeter away from a game-ending double play. Some words shared between Keller and Gonzalez. Those are a pair of second basemen. And now Gonzalez going back to that umpire there. And I think this, I think this umpire crew has had almost enough of these two, two teams in game number one. Funny to see how things will change once we start off game number two. But you can see right there, a big extended discussion by the second baseman, Gonzalez, pleading his case. Looks like they're going to stick with Azara here. As he does have two outs recorded here in the bottom of the ninth, but we are back to the top of the order. If you've just joined us, where have you been? Uh, the game was tied 4-4 four to four at the end of the fourth inning. Then, three straight, very quick, scoreless innings in the fifth, sixth, and seventh. We headed into extras tied at four. Then Jefferson University exploded, including a three-run home run from Josh Lopez, and we're leading 13-4. to four. But four runs now on five hits for Post University. They're back to within five, but more importantly, they're at the top of their order again with two runners on, and here's the leadoff hitter, Michael Pavelchak. Azara still on, comes set, gets his sign. And he hits the outside corner with that one to get ahead of Pavel check. 0 and 1. This one off the end of the bat, and that will do it. McLean covers it, and it will bring this game to an end. A game that looked like it was probably going to be 5 to 4 ends with a final score of 13 to 8. Jefferson University. Hey, great celebration there by their outfielders out in center field as well. They win game one of this doubleheader 13 to 8 for the Rams. 13 runs on 15 hits, one error committed. And for the Eagles, eight runs on 11 hits, also one error. With the win, Jeff Yu streaking a little bit now. They're up to 25 and 12 on the season and 13 and 5 in the CA. CC the loss drops post to 21 and 19 and they are 13 and 6 currently in CACC play. That'll wrap us up here for game number 1. Give the win to the Rams, but remember we have a whole nother game on senior day here for this double header. For everyone up here at the press box at Municipal Stadium, my name is Chris Del Sordo. Thank you for hanging out with us. The Rams of Jeff Yu victorious in game number one by a final score of 13 to 8. Don't go far. We're going to start our broadcast for game number two very shortly here on the Nest Network. Thank you for joining us on our coverage of Post University Eagle Sports. We'll be right back with game number two.